Ok, super. Bonjour, euh, mon nom est Catherine Debarra et je suis la directrice du département d'histoire et d'études classiques à l'Université McGill. Et je vais être votre euh, bergère, berger, pour, euh, pour la, la journée. Et je suis aussi euh, modératrice de cette première séance. Euh, je commence avec quelques, quelques petites notes avant de vous euh, de faire la bienvenue à, à tous. Euh, ces séances sont... Euh, traduite simultanément. La première séance aura lieu en anglais. Donc, si vous voulez, euh, s'il y a des francophones dans la salle ou sur Zoom, euh, vous pouvez, euh, euh, vous avez des écouteurs pour ceux dans la salle. Et sur Zoom, vous avez un petit, euh, tic, un petit icône euh, planète pour obtenir la traduction euh, en anglais. OK? So, um, welcome everybody. Welcome everybody in the room. Uh, welcome to people on Zoom. Um, this is day two of our uh, wonderful Wampum Symposium. Uh, we had a, um, a, a day yesterday chock full of learning and exchange, and I think um, that uh, we're fortunate that today is, is, is looking uh, much the same. So welcome back, welcome to the panelists, um, welcome to visitors from near and far. We have an audience full of uh, extraordinary expertise as well <clears throat> that's enriching our discussions. Um, it's a grey Friday, um, perhaps appropriate in some sense to turn our thoughts to um, wampum in the era of the American Revolution. Um, in myth, the era of the American Revolution is an era of liberation and democracy. Um, for indigenous people, it was a turbulent, terrible time on the whole, um, and an era in which uh, wampum um, circulated uh, to a significant degree and in uh, all kinds of new and interesting ways. Um, so I'm going to introduce our two panelists. Our session uh, will run until 10.15, after which <clears throat> there will be a half hour, uh, half hour break. So our first panelist uh, is with us here. Darren Bonaparte, our second panelist, is on Zoom. So welcome, Darren. I can't see you, but I know you're there. Um, Elizabeth Elborn is Associate Professor in the Department of History and Classical Studies at McGill University. She's published widely um, on the global, uh, on the British Empire, very much from a, a global perspective, and I, I won't run through Elizabeth's many publications, but I'll simply draw your attention to her most recent book, uh, Empire, Kinship and Violence. Family Histories, Indigenous Rights, and the Making of Settler Colonialism, 1770 to 1842, Cambridge University Press, um, which has large uh, chunks um, of Haudenosaunee history into it. And I think it's from that that Elizabeth will draw today. Um, I'll also mention that she's currently co-editor with Dr. Shino uh, Konishi of a, a volume covering uh, 1750 to 1914, of the five-volume forthcoming Cambridge History of Colonialism and Decolonization, also with Cambridge University Press. Um, and then after Elizabeth gives her presentation, we will listen to Darren Bonaparte, whom I think many of you know. Darren is with us uh, on Zoom. Uh, uh, Darren, also a um, widely published author and researcher who's worked for the uh, for Aquasasne's governments, cultural centers, and media organizations. Uh, and many of you will know um, his work as the creator of the Wampum Chronicles, um, a website dedicated to Ganyangehaga history. Uh, he was elected to the Mohawk Council of Aquasasne in 2000 and currently serves as the director of the Tribal Historic uh, Preservation Office of the St. Regis uh, Mohawk Tribe. Um, he has many publications. You will see them um, if you look at the author bio. Um, uh, let's just say most recently, An Early History of Aquasasne, the works of Franklin B. And somebody's going to have to tell me how to pronounce this guy's last name, H-O-U-G-H. Haw? Haw. Okay. Franklin B. Haw. Um, in 2018, he wrote the libretto sign of his um, wide-ranging activities for Indigenous Visions and Voices, a concert composed by Barbara Kroll, Odawa, and performed by the McGill Chamber Orchestra. I saw that and it was fantastic. So, um, uh, well, I think he'd love us to hear that he was also historical and uh, cultural consultant, not just for the war that made America, 
but for FBI Most Wanted and Outlander 2018-2019. So a Renaissance man on Zoom. Elizabeth. Um, so much. I am a little nervous about presenting in such august uh, company, uh, not least with uh, Darren Bonaparte. Um, but I hope that my contribution from the colonial records will be useful. During the late 1760s and the 1770s, in what were then the borderlands between six nations, oops, maybe, blah. Uh, I'll start again. During the late 1760s and the 1770s, in what were then the borderlands between Six Nations Land and colonial New York, wampum was exchanged at an extraordinarily high rate in council meetings and other forms of diplomatic negotiation between representatives of the Haudenosaunee and of the British colonial administration. This was a very difficult time between the end of Pontiac's war and the outbreak of the American Revolution in which settlers and soldiers often brutally killed indigenous people, and in which there was great pressure on indigenous land. The quantity of wampum exchanged arguably reflected the urgency of negotiations. The most significant of the colonial administrators with whom the Haudenosaunee interacted were from the so-called Indian Department of the British military, as many people will know here, notably in the shape of the most important borderlands power broker, Sir William Johnson, superintendent of Northern Indian affairs. Johnson is in many ways a figure of myth, uh, not least for his relationship with Molly Brandt, a Ganikahaka woman with whom he had eight children, whom this is the eldest, Peter, as also for his role in crafting the 1763 proclamation line. I would argue that he was a less unusual and more predatory borderlands figure than some of the myth would have it. But that is perhaps a topic for another day. Johnson was an adept at meetings, which were, after all, a large part of his job. He often hosted delegations at the house he had built, Johnson Hall, which is a major power center in New York. He's really kind of practicing the power of the household. He maintained a pool of translators and had records of the formal council meetings with indigenous people at which he was in attendance, transcribed and circulated. These records meticulously documented the moments at which wampum and strings of wampum, wampum belts and strings of wampum were exchanged. So these minutes, as well as letters and other papers of Johnson and his associates, provide a rich, if secondhand and problematic, source for seeing the use of wampum, as it were, on the fly. Today, I want to look at three examples from these 18th century colonial records to illustrate both quotidian but also unusual uses of wampum, as well as a difficult fourth example in which wampum was pointedly not exchanged and agreement was rejected. Haudenosaunee interlocutors might sometimes make a creative use not only of wampum, but also of the performances around the presentation of wampum, even as exchanges were closely governed by ritual. This was also the case for a handful of colonial officials, such as Johnson, although clearly these were the actions of outsiders, and I do think it is an important dynamic that these figures are not necessarily uh, reflecting always uh, the full um, intentions and will of their colonial masters. Uses that look unconventional reveal the creativity of wampum exchanges, albeit within tight rules. Secondly, I also want to underscore that in these you know, really tense years, the exchange of wampum was a critical part of the way in which different groups that are struggling for control are trying to control information, as there is uh, networks of information exchange certainly included oral memory, oral exchanges in formal context, but also rumor, scandal, written text in English, written text in Kanekaha, and the use of council minutes. And thirdly, I want to suggest that Johnson sometimes made a slightly duplicitous use of wampum exchanges by telling European partners what to do and suggesting to indigenous interlocutors that European people and institutions may have understood wampum when in fact they, they did not. Although I think that's a very open question, which I would like to be really keen to get your views on. So to me, this does underscore the extent to which colonial officials tried to use wampum to their own ends, but they used it very extensively. My perspective is clearly limited and colonial, and colonial sources are clearly problematic. But still, I hope 
that four examples from the colonial records from the 1760s and 70s do provide a revealing part of a bigger picture. So to get a sense initially of just the multiplicity of uses of wampum, consider a single month's worth of proceedings that were documented by Johnson in uh, what he called the Journal of Indian Proceedings, uh, which he compiled for the month of June 1766 in the really difficult weeks before peace was concluded in the, at the end of Pontiac's War. As was the case with other such men and two Ganekahaka leaders, came on behalf of the entire Onondaga community. They said they spoke for the leaders and the warriors on the grave errand of informing Johnson of the murder of four Onondaga warriors by British soldiers at Fort Pitt, as well as the murder of an Onondaga woman near the fort, a Wendat man at Sandusky by a trader, a Shawnee at Logstown, and seven Tuscaroras and Oneidas who were on their way back from North Carolina. And one of these men, and I have to warn you that I will mention the specifics of a violent act, uh, was, was wounded in the leg, taken prisoner to the fort, and there blindfolded and shot. Um, Tabas Gutta presented a large white belt interspersed with black figures desiring Sir William to let him know the reasons of his people murdering so many of, them, of theirs at a time of profound peace and insisted on his telling them by what province it was done and that, and that as soon as possible. On the same day, a group of Oneida came. Their spokesman used three strings of wampum to request Johnson to remove trading posts with their ancillary um, use of alcohol from their territory. Johnson gave three strings to mark his response. At the end of the day, representatives gathered from all of the Six Nations to discuss the crisis of the murders. The Ganikahaka representatives privately told Johnson they thought the Oneida story didn't totally hang together. Um, and then, sorry. On June the 20th, and I do apologize if I'm not pronouncing his name properly, Aragi Adeka used three strings of wampum to perform a condolence ceremony for the four murdered warriors. And then he urged the Onondaga in the name of Sir William and of the Kanikahaka to remain calm and not to retaliate. Sir William gave a large white belt uh, using white wampum to call for peace. And he assured the Onondaga representatives that he knew nothing of the events, but he would investigate and seek punishment if appropriate. And when he knew the truth, they should receive a belt from him in return for the one they had left. He then, quote, only showed them their belts and promised to send another with the accounts. And then the Onondagas, Cayugas, and Oneidas withdrew, leaving the two Kanekaaka castles. Um, and the, the men who were left then immediately, according to Johnson's minutes, um, then arranged a condolence ceremony for three, reader, for three leaders and decided who would give what Wampa uh, Johnson gave, quote, a good black belt to cover Gawahi's grave, while the other two communities gave a belt each for each of the other two dead leaders and then seven other belts for different parts of the ceremony. So these examples, just from one kind of a couple of weeks, underscore the multiple uses of wampum in diplomatic exchanges, including the use of strings for ancillary points and belts for major issues, as well as the ritual use of wampum in ceremonies of condolence. In writing to Gage, about the murders, Johnson used reference to the belt to underscore the urgency of the issue, saying he had received a large belt in the name of the whole Confederacy, but he also conveyed the spoken words of the, um, of the spokesman. So there is a double use of forms of communication. Um, the large size of the belt and its striking black figures underscored the seriousness of the issue. It's also noteworthy on a very different level that there is what seems to be a discussion of who should contribute what wampum for a condolence ceremony, uh, underscoring the economic issues around paying for wampum, and perhaps gives us a, a glimpse of discussion and of relationships preceding a, a ritual. So as this discussion suggests, Johnson made a pretty ample use of wampum in his communication with indigenous communities, as did indigenous spokespeople in communicating with the British. The account books of the company Finn and Ellis record the sale to Johnson in August 1768 of 45 pounds worth of 32,800 black wampum and 15,000 white wampum at a cost of 19 pounds for a cost total of 50, 64 pounds, pretty considerable 
amount at the time. Another example, before his death in 1774, Johnson purchased 30,000 black and 30,000 white wampum beads for 97 pounds. Uh, and is recorded as paying somebody, uh, it's not clear who, for making them up in proper belts. Uh, it, Johnson was clearly a major purchaser and a redistributor of wampum beads, drawing on Alba, Albany's role as a center of production in the 18th century. Johnson's deputies also used wampum liberally, but they probably had less of it. Um, in July of that same year of 1768, for example, uh, Daniel Klaus, who was based in Montreal, sent a wampum string to the Mississauga via a party visiting Ganawake to salute their chiefs and people at home and acquaint them with what I told them and that they should not listen to every person that would pretend to tell them any news of consequence. So a smaller amount of wampum is used, again, in this kind of politics of information to make a plea for trusting the Indian department um, against uh, rumor and competing environmental uh, information sources. So my second example is both different and difficult and less conventional. It, it uses a case in which objects other than wampum were presented, I think, to mark contempt and to underscore a lack of agreement. Um, as members of the Ganiwaki community of Kanajahare um, presented, protested against the ongoing efforts of local settler and trader George Clark, who might be, a, again, a figure familiar to some of you, to claim their land based both on a much disputed past deed and on recent efforts to persuade people to sign a paper giving him land rights. So this was in violation of community norms. Land sessions should be openly agreed upon by the entire community in deliberation and agreements marked properly by Wampum. So community members um, accused Clark of trying to get individuals drunk to trick them into signing. Um, the exchange happened at a meeting in 1763 in Kalajahari, territory which belonged to the Ganagahaka, but was then surrounded by British claimed territory on the borderlands between Six Nations and colonial land. Uh, so this is a community members at, at this time often protested the large scale sale of cheap rum by traders as a means, many argued, to induce people to sell their furs cheaply and to agree to disadvantageous land sales. So in some, the circulation of alcohol was a major flashpoint to political controversy. Uh, and in both Six Nations territory and in Quebec, Haudenosaunee people in the colonial records assailed British officials for allowing traders to enter hunting grounds with rum and establish trading posts at which young men might um, uh, trade furs for alcohol at disadvantageous rates. So alcohol was seen by many, I would argue, at this time as a tool of white domination that needed to be resisted. At this meeting, there were present William Johnson and a whole slew of other people. I realize I'm actually running a bit short of time, so I won't go through the full list of people, but it's basically almost the entire um, the eminent men of the community, uh, both indigenous men and the local settlers, and also um, women who are 33 of the principal women of the, of the community. The speaker for the Kanojahari argued that Clark had persuaded scattered people to sign away land by making them drunk. He owned a tavern. He also had a mill, which community members needed to access if they wanted to grind, to have corn ground. So in order to underscore that Clark's actions were illegitimate, instead of preventing, presenting wampum strings at the conclusion of a comment, Kian Pieroga three times presented an empty bottle. He reported the people had tried to find he, that they tried to find signatories, had found none, uh, had stated, upon strictest inquiry, we find that liquor must have been the cause of the whole. And we now deliver you a bottle of liquor with which we were beguiled by George Clark. And the record states, gave a bottle. A man um, named um, Atakia Deka affirmed that he had um, actually signed an earlier deed many years ago, but he hadn't meant it. And he'd been constantly passed by Clark to sign again and offered $60 to sign, but he always refused. Um, and then they also come and give a bottle. But, so this meeting continues with various attacks on Clark. Um, at the end, the speaker sarcastically concludes, I'm done with the affair of the liquor, which we have had from George Clark, the governor, who says he is greater than the governor of New York. Anna Hiaro then stood and recounted that shortly after the meeting was announced, Clark had come up to him when he took corn to the mill to be ground and asked him how I came to be so great an enemy of his, like a Frenchman threatening to kill him, and which he told me he hoped I would become his friend and he gave me a dollar. 
but he did not offer me any paper to sign, which dollar I now return, as I will have nothing to do where, therewith. So the report comments in the space and the form normally reserved for recording the laying down of wampum strings or a belt threw down a dollar. No exchanges of wampum are recorded for this meeting. On being asked at the same meeting whether the women who were present had any right in the, in the disposal of lands, the spokesperson explained that the women were, quote, the truest owners being the persons who labor on the lands and therefore are esteemed in that light. So I sense that to exchange something other than wampum was disrespectful is reinforced by the records of a conference between Johnson and visiting Mississauga at Johnson Hall in 1770, uh, at which the Mississauga spokesperson gave some strings and a belt of black wampum, but then explains that the community is extremely poor and the other belts were made out of beads, including an elaborate belt representing um, sorry, I'm coming back to him in a second, representing two figures, one Sir William Johnson and, and the other and the nation taking hold of one another's hands with the assistance of providence marked by a cross. And the speaker said, you can see we're poor because we can't speak to you with belts of good wampum, but you hope, he hoped that they would see that they were still sincere as if we spoke with real wampum. And then Johnson replied, I, say, I see it's uncommon for your nation to speak with such, and it means either poverty or disrespect. But I don't think, you know, he basically says, I don't think it proceeds from disrespect, so I'll take it for granted that what you now say comes from your heart, and I shall consider it in that light. So the issue of clock and the struggle um, to retain land had significant implications for the history of the American Revolution. Uh, shortly before the outbreak of conflict in the Mohawk Valley, which became a huge uh, venue of fighting, a group of young men led by Joseph Brandt, who's here in this more familiar guise in, in his portrait um, painted in London, broke into Clark's house, beat him up and destroyed his papers, trying to eliminate the paper deeds which had the power to render lands to Clark and Fonda. And when Brandt, Brandt went to London as part of a delegation in which he's negotiating with the British, he actually brings up Clark. This is like a major issue for him. And they argue basically that the British need to attend to the question of Clark and the lands. But what I want to stress today is that speakers subverted expectations around the exchange of wampum and used the rituals of a formal meeting to deny agreement through symbolically returning money and bottles, um, just as young men would later attempt to burn paper. So I think there's like a overlap of different kinds of communication. A second example I wanted to give, um, which I thought was unconventional, but I actually don't think it's unconventional anymore after listening to the rest of this conference, is um, comes from the archives of the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, which was an Anglican society dedicated to maintaining Anglicanism outside Britain. In 1770, an exchange of wampum took place at a meeting at the home of Sir William Johnson between Genekehaka elders and two Anglican ministers who were asked by the Ganekahaka to send a message to the SPG board in London, requesting um, that an Anglican priest come and live in the community. Johnson was a key player in staging a ceremony. He instructed the envoys on how to act, and he gave them a wampum belt to present. Um, so from the Haudenosaunee side, the exchange resulted in a wampum belt being sent to a relatively unconventional place, namely to London, cementing transatlantic exchanges in which um, Anglophile groups of the Karikaka had long been involved. This was a carefully staged ritual that underscores um, the way in which exchanging wampum belts was part of a much wider set of uh, communications and performances um, on a transatlantic stage. So the Reverend Charles Inglis, who's here, and Miles Cooper reported back to the SGG um, that they had traveled 300 miles to visit Johnson. Cooper was the president of King's College, which would later become Columbia. And then they were met, to their surprise, by a formal delegation of nine men um, from Tion de Degen, um, four of whom were principal men. And the spokesman expressed his hope that an Anglican clergyman who was a good man could, become, come, could be found to come and, quote, end his days in the community with much advantage to them and satisfaction to himself, and railed against the fact um, that the government had given religious facilities to former enemies and had not given anything to them, despite the fact that they've been asking for a clergyman to um, <coughs> baptize children and carry out other things, um, despite the fact that they had, quote, shed the finest blood in our nation in your cause. So in, in this um, 
exchange, based the Ganakiaka give Cooper and Inglis a wampum belt, and then in return, the pair give them a wampum belt, and then a child is brought out with women. Um, so the records report on the comments and actions of women, and the um, pair, on, at the request of the community, baptize the child and one of the other stands as godfathers in, in a kind of a, 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 an important exchange of alliance. So in response, the um, English writes to London and says, I'm sending you this wampum belt um, as I've been requested. And what isn't clear to me, however, is whether this would have been meaningful to the SPG, who have not previously, as far as I know, been involved in wampum exchanges. There were clearly significant geopolitical issues at stake. Johnson tied the hegemony in the region of Protestant nonconformists to set the land claims and was at this point trying to support a bishopric which he wanted to be opened on his own land, fusing spiritual and material authority. Um, he, in writing himself to the SPG, he claimed that congregationalist efforts to establish schools were linked to land claims, saying that many of these schemes which had their birth in New England have soon appeared calculated with a view to forming settlements so obnoxious to the Indians who have repeatedly declared their aversion to those who acted on such interested principles, saying that all the good lands in New England being thick settled, they're extremely desirous of migrating and have created much disturbance by attempting it. So it's difficult to know whether the Kanakiaka elders shared this perception, but it would certainly be a further explanation for their efforts to broker a broader, specifically Anglican alliance. In sending a wampum belt to the SPG, they were following in the footsteps of Jesuits and indigenous Catholics who had used wampum to create ties between indigenous mission communities and uh, other communities in France. Although it's beyond the scope of the paper today, it's worth noting that American rebels in New York would in fact reject both British and Kanekiaka Anglicanism. The Anglican chapel to which inhabitants did briefly attract a clergyman would be turned into a tavern during the war by an occupying force with a barrel of rum placed on the reading desk and later it would be turned into a stable. This was clearly a deliberate gesture of disrespect. The final example I want to give of a somewhat unconventional use of wampum diplomacy comes from the correspondence of Johnson's Canadian deputy, Daniel Klaus, with the then governor of the province of Quebec, Sir Frederick Haldeman, during the American Revolution. From his base in Montreal, um, so this is as the war has broken out uh, and there's a time of intense anxiety about trying to, to broker alliances. So from his base in Montreal, Klaus dispatched a loyalist refugee woman, Sarah Cass McGuinness, then over 60 years old, to travel from Montreal to the land of the Six Nations to attempt to hold them faithful to the British crown. McGuinness was a loyalist widow who had spent her childhood among the Six Nations and had persuaded her parents to allow the Six Nations to adopt her. Klaus recorded that Mrs. McGuinness reluctantly agreed he also recorded that he supplied her with belts of wampum and a few goods and gave her full instructions what to say and how to act. She had been burnt out of her home in uh, New York. And as this newspaper account suggests, she had a son who was mentally um, disabled and who had been in chains in the house. He was tied up in the house and um, he was burnt alive. Uh, and the family had fled to, um, to Montreal. Once arrived um, at a central village of the Onondaga, according to Klaus, she was uh, surrounded by people seeking her advice. So I want to um, cite um, the report that Klaus gives as a final um, example to end on. So he reported that soon after her arrival, belts of wampum were from General Schuyler, from the American rebels, were brought to that town. And with an account of the disasters of General Burgoyne and an invitation to join the American side and also threats. And she states that this was communicated to her. And in order to counter this, uh, and the quote that I'm giving is up here, after that, with an authority and privilege allowed to women of consequence only among Indians, seized upon and canceled the belts telling them that such bad news came from an evil spirit and must endanger their peace and their union as long as it was in their sight and therefore must be buried underground. 
which she would undertake to do, and in reality carried her point that the belts were carried no further, though they were to go among the Western Indians. It's striking to me that McGuinness attributed power to the wampum belts themselves, saying that they came from a bad spirit and must have the intrinsic power to damage the community. It's unclear to me from Klaus's account whether or not the belts were actually buried or simply not transmitted further. Whether or not it, it occurred in this instance, the project of burying a belt to remove its power is revealing and underscores the power of a belt beyond its role in communication, as well as the importance of the performance of physical action. So I'm very eager to hear from experts here if that's frequent. Uh, were wampum belts regularly buried um, as opposed to, say, burying weapons? And it's also noteworthy that Klaus dispatched an unconventional figure, a woman over 60, who would have had little status within the British system, but does have status in a Haudenosaunee system. So in this paper, I've highlighted both conventional and relatively unconventional uses of wampum in meetings between the Six Nations and representatives of settler and imperial governments in various guises in the late 18th century. I would take from these records that the performance and the ritual around the presentation of wampum belts and strings were deeply important parts of the meaning of wampum exchange, and adept users could potentially modify rituals as well as the use of wampum itself. But I'm very eager to hear from the experts here. Wampum coexisted with other kinds of communication, including written records, letters, land deeds, oral transmission. On the verge of the American Revolution, the stakes were incredibly high. I would also argue that uh, colonial records suggest that wampum uh, communication was um, sorry, the instinct of a teacher to start walking around. Um, that you know, the wampum communication gets delegated to specialists, the Indian department, who clearly are specialists. But I would also suggest that it's not necessarily clear to me that the meaning of wampum is evident to those to whom it is then being communicated higher up in the chain, but that's maybe a subject to discuss later. So, um, thank you very much. <laughs>
which I'm, I'm pretty proud of. The fact that uh, I'm the seventh generation from Colonel Lewis Cook, and my grandson, therefore, is the ninth generation from Colonel Lewis. So we got some of that in our blood. Anyway, so the belt itself, we the, the approach that we took for this project was to look at what has already been written, because that's the method. You look at what's already been written, what has been said in oral tradition and description. So I want to talk about the actual belt and its description. Um, if viewed from the front, the Washington Covenant belt displays 15 human figures in purple wampum on a background of white, hands joined and arranged on either side of a gable roof building, eight on the left, seven on the right. The figures adjacent to the building are smaller than the others and have a horizontal line of purple wampum above their heads. William Holmes first reported the belt's dimensions in 1883 as 15 rows of strung wampum wide, 650 rows in length, and that made for 9,650 beads. So that's a really big belt. It's not the biggest, but it's way up there. The most recent measurement by William Sturdivant was made prior to the belt's return to the Onondaga Nation in 1989. And he measured it to be 186 centimeters in length, not including the warp fringes, and a maximum of 14 centimeters in width. And the bead count that he came up with was 9,600. So with that description aside, um, we then looked at some of the early historical mentions of the belt and then going back into uh, various accounts where they, they mention it. And we, we came upon a number of them, but one that I want to highlight was uh, recorded by an Onondaga chief, Amos Thompson, and his re remarks were translated by Dr. Peter Wilson, the Cayuga. And uh, what was happening then was they were displaying three wampum belts. And um, one of them was this great belt. So what he said, well, what was recorded was the third belt, a much more elaborate and much larger work, was the great wampum belt. On its groundwork of white were 13 figures of men representing the 13 colonies, a figure representing the president or great father of the capital, and also two figures of Iroquois, which, when the belt was put together, would be placed in the middle of the 13 figures before mentioned, signifying that by this treaty, this circular bond of peace and union, the Iroquois were placed within the protection of the states. So that's a really interesting um, account that was recorded in 1864, as I mentioned. Um, the belt was later uh, sold, and there's a whole history of the, the sale and possession and, and the belt ending up um, in a lawsuit along with a bunch of other belts. So um, we then looked at some of the other recorded um, descriptions of wampum belts, such as William Beecham, who wrote a New York State Museum bulletin monograph about wampum belts, which is a fairly authoritative and concise collection of belts. And he had photographs and uh, and did as much as he could to, to connect those belts to historical events. We also looked at the work of uh, William Fenton, um, the late William Fenton, and he had come up with a number of different uh, historic events that he connected the belt to without documenting where he got uh, those, um, how he came to that conclusion that they were from various events. But he was talking about um, a, a 1775 meeting with the Five Nations uh, or Six Nations, I should say, uh, with the Americans. And, and then he later said it might relate to one of the treaties that happened after the war. And so, again, he didn't include um, documentation to, to support that. So we kind of had to take that in. And then another thing that we, we encountered was um, the Treaty of Canandaigua of 1794. And that was a, a pretty big event, a pretty big treaty. I mean, they hold a parade for it just about every year to honor that treaty with the United States and the Six Nations. So everybody goes and marches in the parade. I think they do a big speech. At, they, they have an event at Ganondigan. Uh, shout out to the folks from there that are here today. Um, and so that's a big event. 
And the oral tradition of that people cite today says that they got the belt at that Treaty of Canandaigua. Unfortunately, uh, the records of that, that treaty, the event, the eyewitness descriptions, there were a lot of people there that wrote about it. Um, for some reason, there's no mention of any wampum belts being presented at that time. That doesn't say it didn't happen. Uh, it could be just the people that were writing down what happened and what they saw were too busy writing down the words and maybe didn't uh, take the time. And you're going to find that in a lot of historical accounts, the, you know, the colonial records. If they, if there is a belt presented, sometimes they'll just say a belt. And you're lucky if they'll say a belt of uh, one color or another color, or uh, sometimes they'll even say, for instance, a path belt, a war belt, but they rarely give a full description of the belt. So we kind of get a little disappointed to, to have that happen. So there's no mention of any belt being presented, which is odd because usually uh, nobody really took you seriously if you didn't come to a council with wampum. That was just the standard. And they might even run you off if you show up without any wampum. We did that. Everybody did that. So it's kind of odd that they would not have a wampum. However, if you look into the records, uh, go to founders.org um, and look up the writings of George Washington. You will find that in 1792, just two years before the Treaty of Canandaigua, uh, there was a big meeting of uh, Haudenosaunee Iroquois delegates that went to Philadelphia, which was the capital at the time, and had a meeting with uh, Timothy Pickering and uh, President George Washington. And he gave a wonderful speech to them, which you can find online. And he men it's mentioned in that uh, text that a great white wampum belt, well, I don't mean to make it sound like a great white shark, but a white wampum belt was presented to the delegates. And another thing that was presented to the delegates was a peace medal uh, that was given to the delegates from the Americans. And it's a fairly large, large medal about that big. And it uh, and you see it in a lot in famous paintings of Red Jacket, the Seneca orator who was present at the time. And so you see him wearing this great big. He wasn't a big guy. So the medal looks huge on his chest. And so uh, later on, Red Jacket was asked, I mean, decades later, he was asked about uh, the Treaty of Canandaigua and the bell and the medal. And he said it was all given at the same time at Canandaigua. So he was at Philadelphia in 1792. He was at Canandaigua in 1794. And so, and he ended up with possession of that, that wonderful peace medal. And um, so is it possible that he just confused the two events years later? Uh, well, he was an older man by then. And according to my wife, us older guys really have some faulty memory issues. I don't believe that to be true, but she insists on it. So shout out to my wife uh, for, for setting me straight on that point. So we're all going to let everybody off the hook on this one. Um, today, people, at, uh, particularly among the Seneca and the Iroquois Confederacy, um, kind of put a lot of stock in, in it being a Canandaigua thing. But treaties are not just what happens on the day. They are also um, incorporate what happened leading up to that day. So at, at Philadelphia in 1792, they laid the groundwork for a later treaty. And so it's it seems to make sense that years later, decades later, they might remember that as all being connected. So we ultimately came to the conclusion that we could not, uh, based on the existing record, pin it down one way or another. And that just happens to be the way it is with a lot of wampum belts. When people go out to try to connect them, to verify the story, to connect what is said at a council with any particular belt, it becomes problematic. And so um, we were kind of left with that. And um, that's okay. Um, I've, I've been able to verify and confirm other wampum belts in my uh, time. And could you just put up the picture of the gentleman with the wampum belt that I provided? Uh, I want to talk about that first. 
Yes. Okay. That's a that's an old Associated Press photograph of my uncle Philip Tarbell, and he has the George Washington belt. Um, he used to work at the New York State Museum in Albany in the 1970s and into the early 1980s. And this was before the repatriation. And there's Uncle Phil. He just passed away of just a few years ago. And uh, I was his favorite nephew. Well, according to him, that's what he told me. He might have said the same thing to my other cousins, but uh, he was near and dear to me. He loved history, loved wampum. Uh, he had great big poster photographs framed of the Hiawatha Belt and the Adadaho Belt and the ever-growing tree belt, which he had on his wall. It was great. So he's always encouraged me to be a, a history guy. And so he, uh, I had to include this photograph of him that I found online and purchased on YouTube or uh, eBay to, to bring old Uncle Phil into the picture. So he's showing the, the George Washington Covenant Belt and uh, he had a great story about his time at the museum, and I want to share that with you. It's my oral tradition. Uh, he said that when uh, he was talking to Irving Paulus Jr., an Onondaga, uh, I think he's a faith keeper or a chief. He's passed away now, but I got to know him personally myself. Uh, in the 70s or 80s, whenever this happened, um, they were talking about repatriating some of the collection back to the Confederacy. And so one day, uh, my uncle heard that there was a grand council uh, being planned for Onondaga. And so he thought, wouldn't it be great if we could bring the belts to show everybody? And so he got in touch with Irving and he said, look, all I need is a letter to show my boss that you want to see the belts and, and I can do it. So Irving said, yep, I'll get you the letter. Well, the a date for the event came up. And no letter, but my uncle steamed ahead and made the big displays for the belts. Uh, I think on a foam board or whatever that is. And uh, he also rented a van for that weekend. And he packed them all up and his boss said, oh, it's okay, you don't need the letter, just go and do it. So he took all those displays with the belts and took them to Onondaga, got to the longhouse. And he saw Irving going into the longhouse. It was a Saturday morning, I think. And he stopped him and he said, hey, do you have that letter? I've got the belts. And Irving said, oh, we'll, 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 I'll talk to somebody and we'll get that letter for you. So he went into the Grand Council. My, my Uncle Philip didn't feel comfortable poking his head in the door. So he waited outside of the van. And eventually he saw Irving come out and he went up to him and he said, hey, do you have the letter? And, and Irving said, oh, no, 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 we were, we were too busy with other things. And then so my uncle said, well, I have to get the van back. Uh, to the place I rented it from tomorrow. So um, when can I bring the stuff in? And they, he said, uh, very soon, I'll come back out and get you and I'll bring some guys to help. So eventually towards the end of the Grand Council, uh, Irving and a couple young men came out and they gestured Phil over. And so they opened up the van, they brought those displays in, they set them up on tables. And so Phil went in there and, and his, his, uh, goal was to see what people said about the various belts, uh, to, to see what their reaction was, um, what they said, if there was any oral traditions that they knew of or whatever, which is a lot to ask for because the belts have been out of your possession for uh, quite a while, um, you know, like 80 years or, or more. So that chain of, com of, of uh, possession, which you need the, the people that uh, are entrusted with that knowledge really need to have those belts present because uh, things can get a little sketchy. And so uh, he he noted that there was very little discussion. Nobody pointed to any belt and said, oh, yeah, this means this or this means that or whatever. So he came away a little bit bummed. But the end result is that the people that were present uh, recommitted themselves to getting the wampum belts back. And so they turned up the heat on uh, the New York State Museum about getting the, the wampum belts repatriated. And I should know also that the New York State Museum had been declared the wampum keeper for the Confederacy when a lot of these belts ended up in their hands. So it kind of had um, the support of the Confederacy at the time. And I argue, and a lot of people may dif disagree with me on this one, that we shouldn't just be condemning of those museum officials and people, collectors that got the belts and put them on display somewhere. 
um, because they at least still exist. They they survived. They're present. Um, I have a story from my experience of a wampum here in Akwesasne that had been kept. It hadn't been sold to any collectors, but uh, it was a gentleman on here in Akwesasne that I got to interview in the late 1990s who told me that uh, his grandfather had a wampum belt and when he died, nobody knew what happened to it. it and he even said it was a purple belt with animal figures on it. And he said, we, we just don't know what happened to it. Well, the man's house uh, eventually decayed and collapsed and it had to be torn down. And so when this gentleman the grandson of this wampum holder uh, was clearing off the property of all, all the old fallen down boards and, and all of that stuff and was, you know, returning the, the land to look more natural. He found wampum beads in the dirt where the house had stood. So what he figured was that his grandfather had a secret hiding place for that wampum belt, probably within the walls of his house or underneath a floorboard or something, and he forgot to tell people about it before he died. So it just got uh, mixed up and ended up in the dirt, and uh, the the binding of the wampum belt, the warps, the wefts, those decayed, and then the, the beads were just loose, laying in the ground. So he gathered up those beads, and he showed them to Ray Fadden. Ray Fadden was a school teacher here in Akwesasne in the 1930s and onward, and he later established a museum in the Adirondacks, the Six Nations Iroquois Museum. I think it's called the Iroquois Cultural Center or the Haudenosaunee Cultural Center. But his son and then his grandson are, you know, inherited it and are running it today. And so if you go to the museum, you'll see a string of wampum that said it comes from Akwesasne. That's the remnants of a wampum belt. So, yeah, sometimes the wampums we keep, uh, they, they kind of disappear and and uh and meet a different fate so at least the wampum belts that are in museum collections can be repatriated at some point and i'm not saying anything about the mccord collection but some of those belts in the mccord collection are very much uh you know our cultural property there's no big repatriation law in, in canada like there is in the united states since 1990 so um yeah repatriating a the Canadian belts is a little bit of a challenge as some of the other presenters will probably tell you. So you can take my uncle Phil down. I'm just about done with talking about the George Washington covenant belt. I want to talk about some of the other uh, reproductions that I have in my collection. Um, some of them, uh, I'm going to point out some of the McCord belts. Um, okay. I'm just going to wreck this wonderful display. That's fine though. <laughs> Uh, this is one of the McCord belts. You'll see the famous uh, lithograph of a Huron chief holding this up that's on display in the exhibit. It's a beautiful belt. I had to have it. I had to reproduce it. Uh, probably dates back to, uh, my guess is that it's the end of the Seven Years' War when the Seven Nations of Canada, the Alliance of Indian Communities up and down the St. Lawrence, who had been allies of the French, were forced to uh, make peace with the British and the Iroquois Confederacy at the end of that war. So that's a, definitely a bury the hatchet kind of belt. This is another of the McCord belts. And this is uh, basically a, an alliance belt representing the Seven Nations of Canada. And uh, you might have heard Rick Hill yesterday mention that um, people have interpreted this as a turtle. If you look at the negative space, the purple, I'm the one that figured that one out. So I, I'm taking credit for that turtle identification because I looked at it for years and years and I didn't, I couldn't figure out what it was until I looked at the purple in that emblem. And I realized maybe it's an allusion to uh, Great Turtle Island, the, the Iroquois creation story and the legend of the, a turtle rising up to catch Sky Woman on its back. So I, I claim credit for that one. If anybody disagrees, well, come talk to me later. Um, okay, another of the belts is this wonderful one. Uh, it's a, definitely a mission belt. It's pretty obvious. It's got a church. It's got uh, clergymen and Indians standing on opposite sides of a cross. Uh, it's, you know, there's been some question about where did it originally come from. Unfortunately, a lot of the belts in the in the McCord don't really give that kind of data about, you know, 
what did the natives say about the belt before it changed hands? Um, okay, I got a couple others. Sorry. Oh, okay. This is the, the biggest belt that still exists in the world, as far as I'm aware, is a belt that was made by the people of Gunasatage um, when they moved to the Lake of Two Mountains and established a community. Originally, they were on the on Montreal Island, uh, just down the road from the McCord on Sherbrooke Street. There was a mission there. Well, eventually, too many French people moved into the area, and they said, could you guys move a little bit north? And so they moved a little bit north, and then after a while, they said, could you move a little bit west? And so they ended up at uh, the Lake of Two Mountains on the Ottawa River. And so they say they built, they made this belt to um, basically be the charter of the community. And they say we buried it underground. And like previous speaker mentioned about burying wampum belts, did they actually bury wampum belts? Yes, I, I believe they did. Uh, they often did would, would to hide them. Like for instance, Sir William Johnson was said to have buried uh, a whole collection of wampum belts on his property. Anyway, I, I'm not going to get into my other hero, Sir William Johnson, too much. But yeah, this belt is amazing. And I had to have it. And what happened was I went to the McCord. I, I've been there a couple of times. I took photographs of this belt and I sent them to a, a fellow wampum guy who makes beads with the same, uh, makes wampum belts with the same beads I do. And I sent him the photo, all the photos that I took, close-ups for, for the accurate bead to bead count. So he assumed that I was asking him to make a reproduction of the belt. And, and about a month later, he, he sent me a picture saying, I'm doing pretty good on your belt. And I'm like, hey, what? <laughs> I didn't actually commission it, but eventually I was able to cough up the money and, and pay for the belt. But anyway, just a little word of warning. Don't send photographs of wampum belts to a wampum belt maker. Make sure you he's very clear about <laughs> what you're sending them for anyway so yeah they call that the two dog belt because there's dogs on the end I, I I don't like to call it the two dog belt and we got to be careful about the names that are associated with wampum belts even the George Washington Covenant belt that name wasn't always attached to the belt belts really don't have names those are nicknames that that people give to them later uh, the real words that go with the belt are the speeches that are delivered when the belt is presented. And those are the things that were memorized was the speeches that accompanied them. Because those belts were documents of speeches. And so you had to uh, remember the speeches for that belt to have any meaning. That's why it's, it's problematic when a, like a belt turns up in an auction that nobody has seen before. And you look at the symbols and, and people try to figure out what it might mean. Sometimes we can do that. And other times it's problematic uh, because you really got to know the original context of the wampum belt and the story that went with it. And oh, I just want to talk about some of the other belts. This is another one that you folks from Gunawage would, would uh, probably appreciate this. Uh, this is a copy of a belt that used to hang in the church in Gunawage. It used to be on display, um, and, and it dates back to 1677. It was said to have been given to the community of Gunawage by the Hurons of Wendage. They used to live together in the same museum, not the same museum, the same village, until they decided to move to the Quebec City area and start a new community. And so they gave this belt to the the people at Gunawage and urged them to, you know, uh, build a, a solid, substantial church because they were just having mass in a longhouse, uh, an old bark longhouse, and decided to, you know, really build an actual uh, proper church. And so they would drape this over the altar uh, and the rafters above the altar to remind them of the, the words and uh, admonishments of the Hurons. So very important belt. Unfortunately, it uh, disappeared and uh, somebody walked into the church and stole it. So if anybody ever sees this out in the world, not this one, um, if you see the original, and this is based on photographs that still exist of that original belt, 
And um, there's a little bit of controversy associated with this bill also that um, what happened was some chiefs quite a while ago um, were borrowed the belt to show it to some Onondaga chiefs that had showed up and wanted them to interpret the belt and to take a look at it. And the priest at the time got mad and charged them with, with theft, acting as though that was church property. It's really not, belongs to the community. Anyway, so there was a big, big hullabaloo about uh, the, the these chiefs that took that. And, and they had to deal with that, the repercussions of that for a while. So anyway, yeah, it's, it's an interesting belt. It, uh, it has these wonderful rectangular uh, emblems on each side of the cross and uh, six in number. And so it's possible that this belt and the importance of it uh, helped to inspire the seven nations of Canada, which wasn't always seven particular nations. It was really just a bunch of villages and not always seven. The number fluctuated, but seven is a bit of a sacred number in the Catholic faith. Um, for instance, the days of the week, the calendar, uh, all associated, the Mohawk words for the days of the week um, are associated with various Catholic observances throughout the week. And so I don't want to get into too much detail about that. But anyway, so that's another belt. I had to have it. It was it was a real important historic belt. So I did make a replica of it. Anyway, um, let's see. Another belt I have here is... Okay, if you just bear with me here. I have a, a one of the Paris belts that was on display um, uh, that came and is, is in the McCord now. It might have already been returned to France. Um, I don't seem to see it offhand here. Um, I know I didn't lose it because I just saw it this morning. But anyway, it's the one with the little zigzaggy kind of, um, it's like a little whirlwind pattern. Anyway, I don't know what the heck, <laughs> where the heck it ended up, but I do have it. Oh, here it is, right here in the open. So I want to show you that. And this one I made, I fell in love with the design. It's the most gorgeous design. Um, nobody knows really what is symbolized here. There's speculation. Um, we don't know. We don't really know. But it, it bears a resemblance to a couple other belts out there. But I, I wanted to have uh, this belt made because... Uh, it represents one of the many museum belts that we don't know the story of, that when they left our possession, uh, the story sometimes went with it and didn't come back. So I wanted to have at least one belt that we didn't quite know the story to. I don't know what the heck is that noise back there. But anyway, so I also have strings. I, I made a replica of our uh, traditional condolence strings. This is based on... Um, John Napoleon Britton Hewitt, who did a lot of research on uh, our traditional culture and stuff like that. And so he he did a chart of the condolence strings. They may not match what people use in the Confederacy today, but I did have a really good graphic of them. So I thought I would make those reproductions. And also we have a wonderful set of wampum strings that uh, are associated with the Mohawk Nation. Our uh, nine condoled traditional chiefs are represented uh, by the string, the strands that hang down. And if you happen to watch um, Outlander, I was a consultant on that. Tom Jackson plays a Mohawk chief in, in a few of the episodes. And you'll notice he's wearing that around his neck. That's not my fault. Uh, even though I was a historical and cultural consultant on that show, they didn't run that by me. All they did was email me a few questions. So it wasn't like the war that made America where I, I had an actual clout and, and a say. Uh, this, they went ahead and had Tom Jackson wear that around his neck. When I saw that, oh, I just cringed. So <laughs> anyway, so if anybody ever asks you to be a consultant on any kind of TV or movie thing, uh, don't do it if they're not going to give you a little bit more uh, authority on the thing. They even promised, oh, you can come to Scotland and watch us film it. And eh, they didn't invite me to Scotland. Anyway. <laughs> So I love that show. I only watch it because, you know, uh, just for the drama of it, just because it's something to watch. But uh, yeah, I just want to apologize to anybody if you saw that Tom Jackson wearing that, that wampum string. Anyway, uh, so 
we're getting uh, pretty much to the end of the time, I think. Okay. Um, that's all I want to add. I just want to point out the painting behind me. That's Colonel Lewis Cook. I mentioned him earlier. He's my ancestor. Uh, he's at the Battle of Quebec with the death of General Montgomery. It's one of the most famous paintings of the American Revolution. He wasn't actually there when the general died. He was somewhere else heading to New England to see if he could encourage people to join the American cause. But in that famous, famous painting by John Trumbull, there's Colonel Lewis. He's holding a tomahawk. And so that's a great, wonderful representation of him. Um, it's possible that Trumbull knew Colonel Lewis personally because Trumbull was an officer with George Washington. So, um, but did he actually meet him in person? Is it based on how he looked? It's one of those things that so far history hasn't answered that question. Darren? But, yes. I'm, I'm, I, I have the unpleasant task of being tough and uh and having to rudely cut you off um That's so fine. that we can <laughs> anyway thank you so much so maybe let's give a round of applause to darren thank you so um yes stephen I noticed that uh, they were talking about condolences, condolence chiefs, and uh, condolence belts. Uh, what's the meaning of like the condolence canes? Uh, do they come into the picture uh, in terms of the condolence chiefs uh, recounting the condolences? I can I can answer that one. Okay. Um, well, when a chief dies, they have a condolence ceremony, which is basically to address the grief of the family that he came from, the clan and the family and the nation. And so uh, there's a whole ceremony that goes with that. Um, like I mentioned, there there's a bunch of strings that are associated with that. They go through this ritual, and the condolence is basically to heal the people from the grief that they feel from that death. And then they raise up a new chief to take the name and the place of that deceased chief. And so there's a cane and I, I have a, a replica of the cane that I just didn't bring today um, that has all of the names of the chiefs depicted in little engravings, one end or the other on the, on the cane. And it has pegs for each of those names. And they take the peg out when he dies and then when they do the ceremony to uh, replace him with a new chief, they put the peg back into the uh, into the the cane. And so there's uh, 50 altogether representing all the different number of chiefs. There's nine Mohawk, nine Oneida, and I I forget the number of the Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca. Um, shame on me, but yeah, I kind of forget that. And uh, there was what they also call a small condolence, where they would take the first three strings of that uh, condolence array that I have here, and they would kind of greet each other at councils and say these three um, these three words. Sometimes you see it called the three bear words, but I think that's actually just an anthropologist innovation that we've kind of taken on as a little bit of feedback. Um, I don't know if the, they ever really said three bare words or whatever, but it's become popular, so they say it. And so they would they would hold up strings when visitors would greet and they would wipe the tears from any grief that they suffered. They would unblock their uh, hearing. Uh, which sometimes when you've been in grief, you you can't hear right. Um, you're, you're all clogged up. So they unblock your hearing, they clear your ears. And then the final one is they give you water to clear your throat so that you can speak again. You can join in the speeches. You can, you know, share your story, maybe even sing songs. You can laugh again. It's a way of bringing people out of the darkness of grief back into the light to put aside those hard feelings. And another expression that they would say is we cover the bones of the dead with wampum so that the sight of them doesn't stop us from doing the good work that we're meant to do. 
And um, you're always supposed to keep things positive, you know, uh, always try to, you know, bend over backwards to help the process of peace, bury your hard feelings, do away with them, don't let them upset you. So the condolence thing is a real big deal. It wasn't just the traditional Confederacy people, the Seven Nations of Canada people did the same ritual. They, they carried on wampum traditions like I just sh showed you with some of the other belts. So uh, they remained a very cultural people, even by taking on Catholicism. Uh, our own saint, Saint Gadali de Gaquita, was a wampum belt maker herself. She's the first person identified by name in the historical record as being a wampum belt maker. And so I'm pretty proud of that little fact. Anyway, uh, does that answer your question? Um, I'm, I um, was just saying, Darren, there are a lot of questions for you online, and we, we won't have time to go through them all. Many of them are just expressing gratitude for the, the stories that you're telling, um, also asking about the uh, protocols uh, connected with making reproductions, and maybe some of those can, can perhaps be, be sent to you. Just one for Elizabeth, which was, um, what do you know about, uh, what if anything do you know about who would have made the wampums that um, the British or William Johnson is giving to, um, uh, to his various interlocutors? Do you have any, any um, sense of that? I'm actually wondering, I think people here might know more he is getting them from albany and i think that there are wampum makers there are people who um in albany who also um make belts but i don't know the trade networks um so i'm reluctant to say anything with so many experts in the room who will know more about the trade networks but there is a um albany based production and also new jersey based um, production and I know he's supplying people in Montreal and in other in other parts of the region so he's acting as a broker um, but if anybody knows more about how wampum is produced in Albany in the audience another, okay that's another okay, helpful another, answer sorry <laughs> <laughs> that's right. An another to topic opened up yeah. uh, another topic opened up um, Okay, so there is, um, I think maybe we have time, we'll just take two more, is that about right? Okay, um, so so Darren, there's a, a, a comment, maybe a comment question about the context for the theft of the, um, uh, the theft of the wampum that you referred to, and is Gerald Reed suggesting that it, it, um, uh, it took place in the context of uh, the attempt to create the Longhouse Society. Um, does that uh, does that ring a bell to you? Oh, you're talking about the the big church bell when they charged the priest. Yes, yes. Um, I don't know if that has anything to do with um, the creation of the Longhouse or anything like that, but it, I think they were making connections back to Onondaga, and uh, so I, I'm I'm a little I'm I'm not really. I can't really answer that question entirely. I, I know Gerald has, a, has done a lot of research on this aspect of it, so he probably knows the answer better than I do. So okay, okay. Not sure why he's asking <laughs> me. Okay. <laughs> um, so any uh, any final questions from the uh, from the audience? Okay. Now I'm having trouble. Can can somebody who can maybe Jonathan? Can you help me out here? Because I've lost the uh, I've lost the questions on the screen. Just pick one. One is uh, one people, uh, one person noticed that the two presenters have seen the different views on William Johnson. So, right, that's a good one. That's a good one. Maybe, maybe t two seconds each. We have the hero and the anti-hero. I, I think he's a mixed man who um, is both actually extraordinary and who has real cultural interaction in a way that is um, deeply important, but at the same time, he's also enriching himself. Uh, so I see him as somebody who maybe is shades of gray rather than either a hero or a villain. And I'm very e interested to hear what Darren thinks. Are you talking about Sir William Johnson? Yes. <laughs> well, um, it's, hard, it's, it's hard to encompass such a, a profoundly important historical figure and to pass judgment on him 
All I know is that if he hadn't died in 1774 and he had stayed in his position, I believe the American Revolution would have ended the other way. That's just my take on it. I, I have no evidence to back that up. But he would have kept the Oneidas and the Tuscaroras well within the British camp, um, even though there had been rumblings of discontent with him and his, his British friends from the Oneidas and Tuscaroras. Um, but Sir William Johnson, he took to wampum like nobody else, and, and he made massive belts, and he understood the importance of it. And, uh, you know, and when he, and he, he understood the protocols so well, probably better than any colonial official. So, yeah, it's something that I think about all the time, uh, really how to, how to take him in and, and what's, what's really going on. He, yes, he did make himself rich. He ended up with thousands, thousands of acres of Mohawk land. And a lot of that ended up being given back to Molly Brandt, but she lost all that when the American Revolution broke out. So yeah, he's he's quite a, a character and we still have to really uh, come to our own conclusions, I guess, about you know where he lands on the spectrum, so they say. One last thought from Elizabeth. <laughs> oh, somebody else in the audience had a thought. Maybe. I'll, I'll, I'll see to the person in the audience. While you're setting up, could I add, though, that I think Johnson had clout with the British. Like, I feel like he was able to carry through the promises that he made, and I don't think the people who replaced him were able to do that. That's another political issue that I think it's really important. Yes, I have a question for uh, Darren. So that belt, the George Washington belt, that has 15, 15 men on there? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's a story that uh, at the 1795 Treaty of Greenville that um, the Wendat who were there were, were, somebody had lent them a belt and it was supposed to have 15 fires representing the United States. And I'm just wondering if that's, if you've ever heard any stories of that's the same belt um, that they used at the Treaty of Greenville. No, I don't. I don't believe it's the same belt because there were so many different belts, and like I said, it's problematic when you try to connect uh, the the vague descriptions in belts with um, actual belts. So yeah, I have to weigh in on um, catch me next year. I might know that one by then. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. On that note, sadly, we have to end. I, there are thirteen questions, or you know, more than uh, queuing up. So we'll we'll try and save them and communicate them to the to the speakers. Uh, but uh, so now we move off to have coffee and continue the conversations there. And Darren, it's such a pity you can't join us because we'd be talking your ear off. So thank you very much. Um, Bonjour, Tenue Magnitok, Wopski Mangan in the Go, Makwa and Totem, Kutiting in Donjaba, Nemiquichuendam. Hello, my dear relatives. I'm Aaron Mills. I'm an Anishinaabe from Kutiching First Nation in Treaty 3. I belong to the Bear Clan. I'm really delighted to be moderating this uh, second panel of the day, Migus Apikan. The message is the burden, Wampum in Anishinaabe contexts. Um, not just because it's a fascinating subject that I am deeply invested in, but um, the speakers are folks that I've known for many years, and this is an occasion to reconnect and learn from them, as I hope you all do today. I'll introduce them both, and then um, we'll jump right in. So our first speaker will be Dr. Alan Ojig Corbier, Bene Dodem, Ruft Grouse Clan. He's an Anishinaabe from Chiging First Nation on Manitoulin, educated on the reserve and having attended uh, University of Toronto for his Bachelor of Science and then York University for a Master's in Environmental Studies, uh, during which he focused on Anishinaabe narrative and language revitalization, for which he's very well known. For five years, he served as the Executive Director of the Ojibwe Cultural Foundation in Chiging, um, where he served as curator and historian. 
And also he served as the Anishinaabemowin uh, Revitalization Program Coordinator at Lakeview School in Chiging, where he and his coworkers developed a culturally based second language program um, focused on using Anishinaabe stories to teach language. He defended his PhD in 2020 and is now assistant professor in history at York. He's also the tier two Canada research chair in indigenous history of North America. And sitting beside him in the front there is Dr. Heidi Boecker, uh, who investigates the history of indigenous crown relations, treaties, and federal and provincial government policies towards indigenous peoples in Canada. She teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in treaty history. I've been fortunate to audit one of them once upon a time. The history of residential schools in Canada and Canadian legal history, which we'll hear about today. As co-director of GRASIC, the Great Lakes Research Alliance, she also studies Great Lakes cultural heritage stored in museums and archives around the world and seeks ways to reconnect that heritage to Great Lakes First Nations. So welcome to you both. I'm looking forward to learning from you today. I think uh, uh, we have lots to say, so I will uh, step down and welcome um, Alan to the podium. I'm from a reserve on Manitoulin Island called Michiging, and we say that's where Nanabojo ran right through over there, and he dropped his spear, spear handle there. So, Natam Dash Nami Gwachiriaka Gundak Enkijik, Memdege Dash. Maba Jonathan I want to take time to thank Jonathan and everyone else that worked on this gathering, uh, but Jonathan for actually following up and asking if I uh, accepted the invitation. Uh, I'm at a point where um, sometimes I'm, I'm getting lazy to, uh, to do such stuff. So I wrote this down and I hope it remains cogent, but uh, Jinago dash gi apchago gi mnatwak gundak gagi gidajik. Yesterday there were some really good speakers and I, I was really um, inspired by that. And then of course this morning kept the momentum going as well. So I'm going to read. Uh, this is a little known fact, but it's actually probably more known than I know is uh, I was an altar boy. And so when I read, this just reminds me of doing the first reading at church. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to start with a letter from uh, Rick to Ken, uh, to Kevin <laughs> at Kanasatagi. Initially, I started thinking about this paper with a basic question. How and when did the Anishinaabek start to use wampum? After spending some time looking at historical atlases, maps, and archaeological papers, I started to see specific trade routes that were taken to ferry wampum from the eastern seaboard inland to Anishinaabek around the Great Lakes. I also started to see some, some of the timeline provided by archaeologists and Jesuits and fur traders. I had also collected four published Anishinaabe stories about the origin of wampum. It comes as no surprise that there are discrepancies between the Anishinaabe version of where and how they obtained wampum and the version told in colonial government documents and the archaeological record. The focus of this paper then sharpened and I started to approach it as a way to work through epistemological issues of wampum, such as how wampum came to be incorporated into Anishinaabe language, story, ceremony, life, trade, and diplomacy. Yesterday and today, we had heard principally the Haudenosaunee wampum story. This is the Anishinaabe story of wampum. Um, I will start with the word. 
of course, on the biblical references. <laughs> that, which, that which we now call wampum is actually two separate mollusks, quahog and whelk, both harvested and processed on the eastern seaboard by Algonquian-speaking nations. Bradley in 2011 notes that the word wampum is derived, quote, derived from the Massachusetts term wampum peak, or for white strings of wampum beads, and sakup peak for black string. The English disregarded the color of each bead as well as the organism it was derived from, quahog or whelk, and just started to call both beads wampum. The Anishinaabe do likewise. Their word for wampum, regardless of color or organism, is megus. This word, however, also refers to a third organism, the cowrie shell. The cowrie figures prominently in the Medewin, the medicine society of the Anishinaabe, which is beyond the scope of this 25-minute paper. To confuse matters more, English and French speakers have translated megus as wampum, pearl, oyster, and porcelain. In short, the fact that this Anishinaabe word migus refers to three different types of shell has presented analytical challenges at times. The etymology of migus is unknown or uncertain, I should say. It is interesting to note that migus has no linguistic relation to the freshwater clam, which the Anishinaabe call S or SE. It is understandable that whelk did not come to be called S because it does not resemble the clam's shape. However, the quahog does resemble a clam and could have been a logical name transfer. For instance, today, the abalone shell is called esonagan, meaning clam dish or clam vessel. Since migus is not linguistically related to es, it is, it, its unknown etymology may hint to its antiquity. In fact, this antiquity is also referred reinforced in some Anishinaabe creation stories that state crea creator blew his breath through the migus shell to give life to the Anishinaabe. So you see here, oh, these other ones didn't show up. Anyway, there was, two pic there was a picture here of, uh, of uh, the uh, whelk, and then this was a quahog. Oh, you do? How come I can't see it? <laughs> it must be the angle, eh? So anyway, the shell looks like the abalone shell. So this is what they call esonagan now. And then the quahog actually takes the shape. So you could, we could have just called it chis, but we never did. We ended up calling it migus. And this is the same organism, although they don't look the same. In 1838, uh, Indian agent come, oh, that's where. <laughs> so these guys were all lying to me. In 1838, Indian agent come ethnologist Henry Roll Schoolcraft published Algic Research Researches, which featured Nanabojo, a being who is half spirit and half Anishinaabe. One day, Nanabojo was asked, asked his grandmother about their family history. She revealed that her husband, Nanabojo's grandfather, was killed by Nido, a spirit named Migus Ogwan, which Schoolcraft was told meant wampum or pearl feather. This word is a composite of an animate noun, migus, and a final morpheme, guan, meaning feather or quill. I point out the name is, that the name is not a full compound noun, migus miguan. Migus miguan are two full words for the organisms, but uh, the actual name in this case is migus oguan, and that means the uh, pearl feather or wampum feather. This is significant because Anishinaabe when speakers natural tendency is to use verbs even in names, uh, even in names. And I suspect as well that this name uh, uh, attests to its long-standing incorporation into Anishinaabe belief and cosmology. Nokomis, no no which is grandmother, told Nana Bojo that the Nido lives, quote, on the opposite side of the Great Lake, end quote, and is protected by fire-breathing snakes and other powerful beings. Ignoring his grandmother's admonitions, Nanabojo prepared to go to war against Wampum Feather. From a distance, Nanabojo saw the flames of the serpents. He stealthily approached and killed them. He then saw the, quote, lodge of the shining Nido situated on a hill, end quote. Nanabojo scoped out the area and then waited for dawn to arrive. 
At dawn he gave the war cry and let loose a volley of arrows. The fighting continued all day and Nanabojo, Nanabojo's arrows had no effect, quote, for his antagonist was clothed with pure wampum, end quote. Near the end of the day, Miga Sogwan gained the advantage and Nanabosh saw that he had only three arrows left and starkly realized that he might lose this battle. At this desperate moment, a large woodpecker, Meme, lit on a nearby tree and yelled, Nanabojo, your adversary has a vulnerable point. Shoot at the lock of hair on the crown of his head, end quote. Nanabojo shot the cue of Migasagwan and killed the Nido. Achieving his revenge, Nanabush let out his Zasakwan, that's the war cry, and taking, quote, taking his scalp as a trophy, he called the woodpecker to come and receive his reward for his information. He took the blood of the Nido and rubbed it on the woodpecker's head, the feathers of which are red to this day. Schoolcraft, end quote. Schoolcraft notes in a footnote that, quote, the tuft of the feathers of the red-headed woodpecker are used to, to ornament the stems of Indian pipes and are symbolical of valor, end quote. Indeed, many of the large Calumet pipe stems from the Western Great Lakes are decorated with woodpecker crowns, as you see on this Calumet, and there's a, a close-up of a woodpecker crown on that pipe stem. The episode links two media of Anishinaabe diplomacy, wampum and calumet pipes. Both implements were used to settle peace as well as to declare war. It's germane to ask whether the scalp of Migisogwan was white or purple or both. Schoolcraft does not provide a color but notes that Nanabojo returns prominently displaying the trophies he had earned on the warpath. Exhibiting these trophies, he shows that he destroyed the nido of wealth, end quote. This is an interesting description, and I am uncertain if the storyteller said this or if Schoolcraft inserted this. This description is problematic because it is it likely references Western values associated with the former use of wampum as money. However, it harkens to another story told by Jacques Lepique and written down by Homer H. Kidder between 1893 and 1895 in Marquette, Michigan, which is close to Sault Ste. Marie. Kidder or his editor titled the story Wampum Hair, but provided no Ojibwe translation of the name. The protagonist of this story is a handsome, proud, vain man with, quote, shining white wampum for his hair, much like Rick Hill. <laughs> he, lives, he lives his life as a single man thinking that no woman is beautiful enough to marry. One day he is told of a beautiful woman who lives atop the White Stone Mountains. Wampum Hair seeks her and immediately falls in love and must have her for a wife. He is then charged with a series of tasks which he completes and further, uh, then the father then gives his consent for their marriage. Wampum hair and the beautiful woman soon conceive a child and that child is born with wampum for hair as well. Immediately after the child's birth, a cradle board, a cradle board of wampum mysteriously appears beside the mother. One day while wampum hair was out hunting, his wife went to get water, then she heard the dog barking, so she ran back to the wigwam and found that her son and the wampum cradle board had been stolen. Wampum hair returned and blamed her for their son's disappearance. He banished her, but she was more concerned for her son and started tracking. She picked up the trail and for years tenaciously followed the trail that led to the underworld. Eventually she caught up to him, but by then he was a young man. They returned to the upper world and he promised to always take care of her, but he told her that he had an, one important task to take care of. He leaves and after many days he returns carrying on his belt, quote, a scalp of white wampum, end quote, taken to avenge his mother. Schoolcraft also published the story but called it Makaki Mindimwe, Old Toad Woman, an Ojibwe tale. Schoolcraft noted that, quote, the cradle was made of the finest wampum, and all its bandages and decorations were of the same costly material. Once the mother caught up to her son, she says, quote, your cradle was of wampum. Your, father, your faithful brother, the dog, bit a piece off to try and detain you, which I picked up as I followed in your track. They were real wampum, white and blue, shining and beautiful. She then showed him the pieces, end quote. 
In this case, Schoolcraft notes the color of the wampum, and in this case, it is clearly not the cowrie shell. These two stories associate wampum with negative qualities, specifically vanity and greed. These two stories may have been influenced by the editors. Both were aspiring or amateur ethnologists. In the case of Schoolcraft, he definitely wanted to be known as a man of letters. Both stories contain Anishinaabe names that convey concepts that the white authors could not have fabricated. Their sources must have been must have told them the words Mi Gisogun, Wampum or Pearl Feather, and Mi Gsantkwe, Wampum Hair, which is a name that, that is still carried in the Sault Ste. Marie area as Mal Gsantkwe. The Anishinaabe names sound genuine but are not in dictionaries, however. Many traditional Anishinaabe names have not made it into dictionaries. Migisagwan and Migsantkwe are not the only legendary characters associated with wampum in the Anishinaabe narrative. The loon, Mong, is described in the Adzokanak as wearing a necklace of wampum. Mixed blood historian William Warren reported that, quote, the loon totem claimed to be the chief or royal family, and one of their arguments to prove this position is that nature has placed a collar around the neck of the loon which resembles the royal migus, or wampum, about the neck of a chief which forms a badge of his honor." End quote. In this case, migus is likely white wampum from the whelk shell, but one could argue that it is strung kauri. In Anishinaabe Adzokanak, Sacred Stories, many animals have and birds have two names. The loon is called mong in Anishinaabe Mwen, and in the William Jones collection of Ojibwe texts, the loon is also referred to as Wei Mig Sago, a raid in wampum. In a story called The Foolish Maiden and the Diver, two young sisters constantly get what they initially want to cha but change their minds when they find out what they actually have. In one episode, they see Jingabis, and that's the hell diver. These are two types of hell divers, paddling by. So they beckon him, but he ignores them. They insistently beckon, Jingabis, Bijan, Bijan, come here, Jingabis, they, they summon him. Finally, he angrily answers, Kawin nin dao si Jingabis, nin sa we mik sa go. I am not diver, I am arrayed in wampum. They beg him to approach and ask him to spit. He secretly takes one of his beaded earrings off and puts it in his mouth and then spits out the beads. The maidens hurriedly pick up the beads and ask him to do it again. So he removes his other earring and puts his mouth in his mouth and spits beads out too. Thoroughly impressing the maidens, Jingabis is an imposter assuming the name of the great chief Wai Meeks ago. He is able to fool the maidens by spitting out regular beads, which are called Nidomene Sak in Ojibwe not wampum beads. Here, Jingabis pl plays them and ends up making them his wives. Jingabis, the hell diver, takes them to his village and says that they will meet their beautiful sisters-in-law who wear earrings made of wampum beads. Gegete apache nishawak gedangwewak mig san nabjebzo nawan gedangwewak. Your sisters are beautiful and they wear wampum earrings. Here, Jingabis tells his new wives that they will see beauty and status, such high status that his sisters wear earrings of wampum. Of course, this is a charade as well. And when they meet his homely sisters, they have earrings of dung. The Ojibwe words here are different. Previously, Jingabis spit out beads, nidomenesak. These are regular beads. In the present passage, the phrase is mig san, nanajebzo nawan, or they wear earrings of wampum beads indicating that wampum was prized in Anishinaabe society. Even though the sisters-in-law were homely and not wearing wampum, the foolish maidens held out hope because there is a dance that evening in honor of Wemiksago, the loon, the real Wemiksago. They, of course, want to attend, but Jingabis tells them women are prohibited from attending the dance. The young maidens go to the dance anyway, and they see the real Wemiksago, they leave the dance with Waimiksago, the loon, and become his wives. It is revealed that Waimiksago is the elder brother of Jingabis. Of course, Jingabis is jealous. Here again, a symbol of status is conveyed 
when describing the real Wu Mixago, he wears, quote, many wampum beads around his neck. Nibowa Mig San Mig San Napkwan. Migis is specifically used here uh, for wampum beads and not cowrie shell. Jones collected another version of the same story, Hell Diver and the Foolish Maiden and the Winter Maker. Different details are emphasized and different uh, terminology is used to describe Wai Mixago. Here, the maidens peep into the dance area and see, see, see uh, the loon, Jingabis's elder brother. They are enamored because a wampum bead dangles from every single hair on his head, a sign of high stature. By the splendor of his raiment, everyone knows who the chief is. I point out the Anishinaabemwin word, Enswankwet, Enswankwet, Nabozowan, Inu Migsan, a wampum bead dangling from every single hair. This uses the same final morpheme in the name for wampum hair, Migsankwe. The translator explicitly translates Migis as wampum bead, but it can be debated whether each strand of hair had a cowrie shell or a quayhog shell bead or a whelk bead. For the, pur the purpose of pulling these stories and names together is to track how Anishinaabe people incorporated wampum, migis, into their language, culture, and worldview. Pooling these Adzokanak sacred stories also gives an indication how widespread the name and story extends, which also gives an indication of the concept's antiquity. Assembling various stories of wampum allows one to compare, contrast, and distinguish the epistemological and ontological orientations held by Anishinaabe and Western people. I have located four stories about how Anishinaabe received wampum. The first published account appeared in 1839. It was published by Schoolcraft, the Indian agent who was stationed at Sault Ste. Marie. His wife, Jane Schoolcraft, was half Ojibwe. In 1839, the publication, publication, the story was called Iyamo, the or the Undying Head, with no indication that it was an origin story of wampum. In a subsequent subsequent re, repackaged publication with many of the same stories, Schoolcraft retitled the story Mishit Makwa, or The War with the Gigantic Bear Wearing the Precious Prize of Necklace of the Necklace of Wampum or the Origin of the Small Black Bear, an Odawa legend. Pretty long title. In this version, this story was is published virtually word for word, just a different title. Two points to note that our the story was attributed to the Odawa and that Schoolcraft was stationed at Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan for many years and thus likely collected the story from the Sioux area, but he does not provide the storyteller's name. The second version was written down by German travel writer Johann George Kohl, who visited Sault Ste. Marie and environs during his sojourn in 1855. Cole titled his story, Legend of the Origin of Bears. So this title too, gives no indication of wampum's origin. Cole did not provide the storyteller's name, but it also came from the Sault Ste. Marie area, and he did not mention the Odawa. The third version was told by Charles Cobogham between 1893 and 1895. It was titled, The Great Bear of the West. By the time the story was collected um, by, uh, Charles Cobalgum was living at Marquette, Michigan, west of Sault Ste. Marie. And this is another version of the Ojibwe, of an Ojibwe telling the story of uh, the origin of wampum. The fourth story was collected in 1903-1905 uh, by the Fox linguist William Jones, Meskwaki linguist. And the storyteller was uh, John Benesse, the chief of Fort William. It was also obscured by its title. It was called An Odawa Obtains Medicine. The distinguishing feature about this story is that it is written verbatim in Ojibwe and then translated into English, a truly valuable resource. The storyteller John Benesse was well known from Fort William to Sault Ste. Marie. So again, there is a tie to Sault Ste. Marie. In this version, the Odawa are the protagonists. Three of the four stories have definitive ties to Sault Ste. Marie area. The fort may have that tie as well. This is significant because Sault Ste. Marie is a major travel way for the fur trade and a gathering place for the Anishinaabek. The four stories are different, but share many similarities. The main commonality is that a journey is undertaken by at least two men. Schoolcraft has 10 brothers. 
Cole has one, but is aided by three old men, to procure wampum from a giant bear who is keeper of the wampum that he wears around his neck, not his waist. Every storyteller emphasizes the danger of the task by stating that many tried before but have perished in the attempt to steal the wampum. Every version has the protagonist's approach, a giant bear who is resting beside a great lake or an ocean. The protagonists sneak up while the bear sleeps and all approach via water in a canoe or a raft. In two versions, powerful assistance is given by an entity from the north. However, three storytellers state that the bear resides in the west. Only Chief Benesis states that the protagonists paddled their raft straight to the dawn, so they headed east. It would be convenient if all four stories had the bear in the east, where quahog and whelk are actually harvested. It would also be convenient because an argument could have been made that the giant bear represented the bear clan of the Huron-Wendat, but that is not the case. Regardless, all four have the protagonists embarking on a canoe or raft to make the last part of the journey, and thus an association with wampum's habitat is conveyed. All four stories also have an escape episode, which the protagonists have stolen the wampum belt and bag in some cases, and flee via canoe. In three versions, the bear awakes and realizes his wampum is missing and starts after the thieves. Sometimes he runs after them until they get to a lake. Other times he imme immediately starts to suck the water, thereby drawing the canoe back towards himself. This also leads to another commonality in all versions. A member in the canoe raft possesses a mys mystically powerful war club and smites the bear, knocking him senseless and causing the bear to expel the water, leading a rush of water to propelling the canoe across the lake and thus allowing the protagonist to escape with the wampum. In two versions, the giant bear is killed and cut up. Each piece or bone is discarded, which then transforms into the smaller black bear that now populates North America. Thus, three versions of the story are also the origin story of the black bear. The origin of a current species of a giant progenitor by a giant progenitor is a common theme in some Odzokanak. Tying the origin of the wampum to the killing of a giant bear and the propagation of the black bear is interesting because the stories of giants are tied to primordial time and not historical time. Therefore, wampum in Anishinaabe reckoning is ancient and not necessarily tied to historical actors, that is the Lene Lenape, Wendat, or Haudenosaunee. These stories also tell us that wampum was valued, but it had to be earned. The journey was arduous and perilous in order to procure wampum for the people. It was not given. It had to be taken from a giant foe who was holding it. Thus, the Anishinaabe inextricably, inextricably linked wampum with war and peace, bravery and honor. From a modern cultural per perspective, it makes sense that the bear is associated with wampum because they are recognized as the keeper of medicines, arbiters of justice, and protectors of the people. Miigwech. Okay, well, uh, first of all, uh, that's a heart, wonderful paper from my, my, my dear friend Alan, and uh, uh, so much to think with in that paper. I want to uh, begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to take part in this marvelous symposium, and also to thank the Kamakehel Nation for uh, being here on their lands and their territories. So I really appreciate that opportunity as a settler scholar in these lands to, to work and live here. And although I've had the great pleasure of working with some of the panelists here over the years and I've learned about wampum from many of you, I do not consider myself an expert. It is a great privilege to be here with those who are. So why am I here is the next question then. Right, okay, so the reason uh, is I am working on a new history of the land purchases in what are now Ontario, or what the Crown calls treaties. Uh, from 1781 to 1862, uh, the Crown, and by that I mean you know, Imperial Crown, Canada, Ontario, but Ontario, Canada, made over 40 individual agreements to purchase land from Indigenous nations in what is now Ontario, ranging from a few hundred acres to millions of acres. And wampum, it turns out, is part of this history too. Now, I am so grateful to the organizers for inviting me because it gave me an opportunity to reflect on the problem of Crown Treaty Number 1, 
uh, which concerns a land purchase from the Anishinaabek uh, for Mackinac Island, now within the territorial waters of the United States. And unique among these land purchases, um, Crown Treaty Number 1 includes a description of a wampum belt within the text of the deed. So on the 12th of May, 1781, Fort Gima, Kichinegan, uh, Pewanas, Keuse, and Higan, wrote images of their dotem, ident uh, dotem beings on two copies of a deed written in English, which they said in the deed that they did on behalf of themselves and their posterity renounce all, quote, claims in future to said island for a consideration of 5,000 pounds uh, worth of goods measured and valued in New York currency. And the deed further states that the parties had signed two copies in front of the witnesses and, quote, one of which deeds is to remain with the governor of Canada and the other is to remain at this post to certify the same. But in addition, this deed states that the Gima promised to, quote, preserve in our village a belt of wampum of seven feet or 2.13 meters for metric folks, which is enormous, seven feet in length to perpetuate, secure, and be a lasting memorial of the said transaction. Now, both manuscript original documents survive. One is in the Library and Archives of Canada. It's called the Indian Treaties and Surrenders Collection, and it is Crown Treaty Number 1. And the other, this is the image there um, uh, in color, is from the Clements Library at the University of Michigan, where it's called the Mackinac Deed. Uh, and to date, I have been unable to find the seven-foot wampum belt. And this is where I pause, and I look out at the room, and I'm hoping somewhere it says, oh, Nicholas stole. Uh, who knows all these? Somebody says this. No, it's not going to happen, but I hope. Um, but as this, this audience is clearly aware, these Anishinaabe Gima would have been deeply familiar with wampum. It carries its own set of meanings and obligations distinct from those expressed in the title deed um, of Britain's property law regime. And although the Mackinac deed appears unique for including a belt in the treaty's text, there are also several surviving minutes of councils with Anishinaabe concerning land purchases that record that wampum belts or strings were exchanged between the parties. Uh, so this is my this is a map of Ontario's land purchases from the government of Ontario, that, um, and the the areas I'm talking about today I've highlighted here. So so far, in addition to the Mackinac deed, I found minutes of three councils in which wampum was used during the period 1781 to 1811. So we have the Crown's purchase of uh, initial purchase of the Mississauga lands between Lake Erie and Huron. Second, for the Crown's 1805 purchase of the, what's called the Head of the Lake. And third, in 1811, for the provisional agreement, that date there is for the final deed, um, for the Council Minutes for a purchase of 250,000 acres from the Chippewas of Minjikining, the Chippewas of Rama today. Now, minutes are not taken or have not survived for all Crown land purchases, maybe for the War of 1812, and in some cases, including purchases, made up here by Captains Crawford and John Collins. Um, there's no deed that survived either or may not have even been created. One occasionally just finds letters of worried Crown officials trying to track down missing documentation. Crawford has it. No, Collin has it. Johnson has it. They're not, it's not there. I set 1815 as the end date for this paper, even though councils for purchases and uh, renewal of alliance relationships continue long after, given our time constraints today, and also because the end of the War of 1812 does mark a transition in how land purchases were funded, and it also marks a transition in the Crown's lack of interest in continuing to be a treaty partner. While I still don't know why the wampum belt was written into the Mackinac deed, I think paying attention to the use of belts and strings in councils where Crown obtained title to Anishinaabe land opens the door for us to think about these purchases in a new way. To date, they have been studied separately from gatherings in which the Crown renewed alliance relationships with Great Lakes First Nations, but I don't think they should be. The granting of land or access to resources to those in need was just one way in which allies could meet their obligations to one another. The minutes of these councils reveal that the title deed was often just one set, one part of a set of undertakings and discussion that would take place over the multiple days when these deeds were signed. Typically, conversations about land took place over multiple gatherings, sometimes those gatherings were separated by multiple years. The minutes and accompanying documentation for land purchases from Anishinaabe peoples situate them within Anishinaabe legal orders and as part of shared Great Lakes diplomatic practices to which the Crown was a latecomer and a late contributor, even as Crown officials sometimes innovated, and in this example, you know, by writing a, a wampum belt into the Mackinac deed. 
Now, research on Anishinaabe understandings of treaty by John Boros, Alan Corbier, Carrie Miller, Aaron Mills, Leanne Simpson, Catherine Sims, Heidi Stark, all emphasize the importance of familial and intersocietal relationships in understanding treaties over a contractual interpretation. Uh, to, quote, to quote Aaron Mills here, treaties aren't legal instruments, they are frameworks for right relationships, the total relational means by which we orient and reorient ourselves to each other through time, to live well together, and with all our relations within creation. They have a legal quality in the sense that they constrain behavior and they are at once political, social, economic, spiritual, and ecological, end quote. So in formal and public councils, allies exchange gifts, especially clothing, food preparation items, weapons, treaty pipes, in addition to wampum and strings, in which they affirm their ability to participate fully and reciprocally in these relationships to care for one another. And they also worked out the specific details of the current moment, whether boundaries between territories needed to be adjusted, whether an ally needed access to another's resources, how the parties would live equitably with one another. And for all land purchases made before 1815 with the Anishinaabek, between the Anishinaabek and the Crown, the Crown paid in goods. They paid in gifts. These gifts were indistinguishable in category or type from the items given to create or renew alliance relationships. As the four councils I discuss here show, what people talked about when they talked about land also covered other aspects of the relationship and their obligations to each other. So Crown Treaty Number 1 follows the conventions of a British title, uh, common law title deed. It has a grantor, a grantee, a land description, a consideration, and signatures of the grantors, grantees, and witnesses. I spent a lot of time looking at title deeds. Other pre-confederation treaties in the Library and Archives Canada's Indian Treaties and Surrenders collection follow these established conventional law forms. Sometimes they're called a bargain and sale, on other occasions it's a lease and release, a deed of fiofment. But regardless, the clear intention is to transfer title or ownership of the land from the seller to the purchaser. Same as if two British farmers were transferring land, selling and buying and selling land. But the inclusion of the wampum belt is a novel twist in the text of the deed for Mackinac the drafter elevates the wampum to the legal record of what transpired. Because while the paper deed kept at the post was the one that would be used to certify the same, that is to turn the land into crown land that could then be patented to private individuals, the wampum belt also seems to have an equivalent function. Recall the deed says it to perpetuate, secure, and be a lasting memorial to the said transaction. But there's another record of uh, related to the Mackinac D that suggests that the context much closer to Anishinaabe ideas of treaty than a simple common law property transaction. In July of 1780, the year prior to signing the official deed, Gov uh, Patrick Sinclair, who was the commander of the post, wrote to Governor Haldeman's aide-de-camp, um, uh, Dietrich Brom, to say, almost as an afterthought, at the end of a very lengthy and chatty letter, that he had already acquired Michilimackinac Island from the Anishinaabek for the crown. I forgot to mention to you that the Indians have delivered up the island, removed their houses, and formally surrendered it, without any presence as yet, in the presence of chiefs of eight different nations who all rejoice at the change. I have explained His Excellency's intention to them to make cornfields of the whole island. No more of their country is required for this purpose. The fort to be on the upper ground. No Indians will be allowed to enter. Their agent's house will be in the stockaded village. They expressed much satisfaction with the whole arrangement, they were told that all of the white people who were married amongst them were called in and would have lots of land on the island. Recall that according to the sign deed, the Anishinaabe exceeded all their current and future claims, yet the negotiated agreement, as Sinclair describes it, to which the Gima of eight different council fires apparently rejoiced, seems to be more about land and resource allocation, locating all the cornfields, especially those needed for supporting the British garrison, in one location, so no more of Anishinaabe country would be needed for the purpose. The Crown and Anishinaabe clearly intended both parties would continue to use the island, since, as Sinclair explained, their agent's house will be in the stockaded village. And as a significant motivation for that session, uh, from an Anishinaabe perspective, concerns provisioning for children and grandchildren and generations yet unborn. As Sinclair indicated, lots would be granted on the island to those whites who had married in amongst them. In other words, to their own, their own kin. So the text of the title deed belies what Sinclair describes of Mackinac Island as a shared space. Now, Crown Treaty Number 1 was signed just five months before the British lost the American War of Independence. After two years of negotiations, the 1783 Peace of Paris recognized the new United States and created a boundary line through the middle of the Great Lakes. British efforts then turned to promoting the settlement of loyalists in what remained of British North America. 
And wampum makes another appearance here, when in 1784, in May, Colonel John Butler of the Indian Department used a wampum belt to call the Mississauga to a council at Niagara to discuss purchasing their lands. He then gifted another belt to them when he made the formal request in council to provide a huge tract of land. At the council, Butler spoke for the crown. Hukwan, Gima of the Bear Dotum, was the speaker for the Mississauga. Um, now, the minute taker did not record the formal opening and speeches, and this is a frustrating uh, common problem, only noting that after the usual ceremonies and co compliments was made, did the business begin. But he recorded that the Mississauga order rose and acknowledged receipt of the belt, presumably the one Pokwan was holding, desiring us to assemble at the great council fire kindled at this place by our king the father. In response to the belt, Pokwan explained, quote, we are accordingly collected our people as soon as possible, and we're now ready to hear your business with us. And then he returns the belt to Butler. When Butler spoke next, he explained that Haldeman had ordered him to purchase some land, the property of you, the Mississaugas. And then he explained that he expected an immediate reply because he'd already given this request. They already had previous consultations with the Mississauga about this. Butler then gives them a new belt. And in reply, Pokwan said they would provide the land provided by the king. And that day, the parties signed the deed. Um, this is the only... Ex oh, stant copy of, oh boy. Okay, I'll let you, they're the only extant copy. I'll let somebody bring that back up. Um, or the, the earliest copy. Um, the party signed a deed. The consideration for the land was 1180 pounds, seven shillings and four pence, which was the cost of the goods distributed to them on that occasion at Niagara and later in September. The minutes give no other information about the belts exchanged, their length, their color, their imagery. Was this belt intended as a record of the transaction as in 1781, or was it another belt, um, such as a covenant chain belt, to remind the Mississaugas of their obligation? Um, Butler had earlier explained to Johnson that he obtained these lands from the Mississauga for, in his words, a trifling consideration. And in that end, he was successful. This is going wildly crazy here. Okay, so over the next 20 years, the Mississaugas would be asked to siege the crown nearly all of their lands fronting onto Lake Ontario for similarly small amounts, all paid in goods. Now, in the summer of 1805, the crown came to the Mississaugas of the credit to ask for the remaining lands along the head of the lake. And by this time, the Mississaugas were feeling the intense pressure and privation from settler encroachment. At this gathering on the Credit River, um, from July 31st to August 2nd, 1805, the Mississaugas came with wampum. They had wampum with them, but the crown had none. The orator, uh, at Kine Benu, rose first in council to give 10 white strings to Klaus so he could recognize their new gima, Okuma Panese. Klaus seemed unprepared and he returned the wampum, asking Kine Benu to bring the strings on another occasion when he could be acknowledged in a proper manner, having no wampum to return to the chief. Kine Benu then spoke bluntly about the impact settlers were having and how the crown was not living up to its obligations as their ally. Kanepanu reminded Klaus that when the Mississaugas had first given land to the crown, Butler, Klaus's predecessor, had promised that the to the Mississaugas that the settlers would be of great use to them. But as Kanepanu noted, we have not found this so as the inhabitants drive us away instead of helping us. That Colonel Butler told us the farmers would help us, but instead of doing so when we camp on the shore, they drive us off and shoot our dogs. Kinebenu's enumeration of concerns continued, but before he explained that they would continue to uphold their alliance by ceding the land. We beg of you to take notice of what I have said. I speak for all the chiefs, and they wish to be under your protection as formerly, but it is hard for us to give away our land. The young men and the warriors have found fault with so much having been sold before. This is a reference to the Warriors Council. It is true we are poor, and the women, the principal women, say we will be worse if we part with any more. Kinebenu was asking the Crown to uphold its responsibilities on the long-standing alliance and to take notice of the cost and the impact of giving up lands was having on the Mississaugas. Nonetheless, Klaus refused to accept their, their offer to cede only part of what was requested, and in the end, the Mississaugas agreed to nearly all of the Crown's demands. On the last day of the Council, and as a result of the agreement to cede the heads of the lake lands, Kinebenu then informed Klaus that there was an underlying uh, agreement with the Tuscarora and with Joseph Brandt's wife that the Crown needed to deal with. 
uh, can have been explained that should the Tuscaroras call on us to fulfill our agreement for attractive land near Joseph France, our father must settle with them for an ox we received, and we will now give you the belt the Tuscaroras gave us on that occasion. A small spot which we gave to Mrs. Brant for a sugar bush, we particularly request you will confirm to her. We will refer that nation to our father, and when this belt is returned to the Tuscaroras, we desire from you to get from them the three bunches of wampum we gave them in return for their belt. The final example comes from 1811, and my slide has disappeared. So there's another slide with William Close on it again. And uh, uh, this is when William Close met at Gwillenberry at the southern end of Lake Simcoe with the ancestors of today's First Nations of Rama, Georgina Island, and Beausoleil Island to arrange for the purchase of a quarter million acres along a route to Penetanguishene. Now, the minutes of this provisional agreement are a rare example where there's a description of opening ceremonies before the record of discussion around the land purchase. In contrast with the 1805 meeting at the credit, Klaus brought at least 11 strings of wampum to this meeting. And the Gima Meskwaki opened the council by acknowledging receipt of Klaus's request to meet, and he gave five strings of wampum. And Klaus replied, saying to Meskwaki that now he took him by the hand and agreeable to the old customs established by your forefathers, proceed to the ceremony of condolence usual on these occasions. It's a little bit of a twist here, though. Uh, he proceeds to offer seven strings of wampum, two, then one, then four, as he first wiped the tears from the eyes of those assembled, cleared a path to their hearts, but wiped the blood from their mats. Klaus then moved quickly to the point of the meeting, framing the need to purchase land to accommodate more of the king's children. Your great father, the king's white children, have increased so fast that in the country that, uh, that he has bought from his Indian children is not sufficient for the number that come in, and therefore on that I now need to address you. The king, your great father, never has nor never will take one foot of land from any of his Indian children without their free consent and paying them therefore. Klaus went on to remind those assembled of your great regard and love towards your father and all his children. And he continued to frame the request as one needed for the comfort and accommodation of the king's white children. He stressed the small size of the purchase. He said how this would create a wider path to the Western Confederacy. Um, and then he gave four strings of black and white wampum. Pointed them to a feast. You must be hungry. I brought with me some of your great father's bread and milk, meaning rum, and some ammunition for your young men. And Yellowhead replied, saying, certainly they would not refuse anything our great father asked for. We freely and cheerfully grant in the land described in the plan. It is not only from my mouth that these words proceed, but from my heart. And he returns to Klaus four strings of wampum. And one wonders if they're not, the color's not specified, but one wonders if they were, those were white. And then there were other business associated with the meeting, including requesting for a blacksmith, Assange's uh, request to keep their garden ground and kind of tanguishing and the need to have some provisions during the summer. So there's much other business that's happening at this council. Yeah. On the afternoon of the next day, the parties gathered again, and Yellowhead spoke to thank Klaus and the Crown, providing the feast on the earlier day, and particularly for the rum, and to request that they meet earlier in the year to renew their alliance, specifically before the rice uh, harvest occurred in the early fall, because too much of their rice was lost when they were away. So this 1811 provisional agreement, like the others discussed here, was agreed to following the requirements of the Royal Proclamation that land be purchased at a public gathering. But it strains credulity to think that wampum was only present at these four land purchases, where it was such an integral part of other alliance renewal councils, and as well as the Crown's efforts to encourage Anishinaabe and Six Nations participation in the War of 1812. So I have no explanation or theory yet for why evidence of wampum exchange was recorded in the minutes for some councils and not others. But nevertheless, these land purchases all took place within the framework of alliance and within well-established Great Lakes diplomatic practices and protocols where allies could call meetings to express their needs to each other and expect that wherever possible, allies would be bound to meet those needs. And there's an epilogue of sorts. Uh, wampum exchange clearly remains part of Anishinaabe Crown relations after the War of 1812, and it persisted as people moved to recording speeches on paper and sending written petitions to the Crown, as also with the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat uh, continue with this practice. Uh, well, once the wampum strings or belts carried the talk, wampum traveled with the words in this new form, or it became paper wampum. Anishinaabe council fires transitioned um, sending new 
addresses and speeches signed with the do their dotem images to lieutenant governors and governors general to welcome them to their posts and to wish them safe travels home when the term was completed. One I know of has survived with its wampum attack. It's in the Library and Archives Canada. Uh, it says uh, it went to Lord Durham when he arrived in 1838, and it was four strings of white wampum, praying that your lordship may be enabled to do all the good things that it is in his heart to do for the white man and the red man on this side of the great water. And then in an Ambaro type taken the same year, Anishinaabe, Ogma, and War of 1812 veteran Oshawana was photographed in his regalia, including gifts exchanged that visually referenced his alliance to the crown, including a treaty medal, but a closer look reveals he's also wearing strings of wampum. And on December 6, 1839, when the Mississaugas invited the Anishinaabe Council fires and the Six Nations at Grand River to a general council to be held the following month, Jones wrote a circular which began with brothers, we send this paper wampum to inform you that a general council is to be held at our village on January 16th next. And at that general council, amongst a host of other business, Gima Meskwaki of Rama and John Smoke Johnson of the Six Nations each read the same belt, which contained a talk of the alliance, the longstanding alliance between the Six Nations and the Eastern Anishinaabe Council fires, first entered into around 1700. Johnson and Meskwaki held the same, uh, yeah, they spoke different parts of the agreement, Meskwaki spoke of uncovered and newly kindled council fires and the constitutional responsibilities of the parties in the alliance, how the fourth mark, for example, represents the council fire lighted up at the narrows of Lake Simcoe, at which place was put a white reindeer or a caribou, and to him the reindeer was committed the keeping of the wampum talk. But Johnson held the same belt and explained the values or intentions of the party on the same belt, reading each mark in turn, noting, for example, that the council fire of Manitoulin, which uh, had um, the emblem of a beautiful white fish, that this signifies a clean white heart, that all our hearts ought to be white towards one another. And on that, I will leave you. Thank you. Miigwech. I had a question I was going to open with, but we have only 14 minutes and I think lots of questions. So, um, that being the situation, I wonder if perhaps it's more prudent to turn right to all of you. Um, so what I'll do is I'll maybe take one or two from the crowd here, and then I think there are questions online as well. And so I'll sort of go back and forth. Um, great, thank you. Hello, thank you both. Miigwech, this was wonderful. Um, a question maybe for Alan, uh, maybe Heidi, you have other elements of answers, but Alan mainly. Uh, cowrie shells, can you elaborate on this? It feels like an intruder at a, a symposium on, on wampum and having a, a vague sense of what they are. They're coming from the Indian Ocean. So what is known about when they enter the, the, the Great Lakes and what role do they come to, to play? You mentioned the, an important role in uh, medieval wind ceremony. It all seems fascinating. Thanks. That, that's the only part that I really, uh was looking at was it being called the Megus and that cowrie shell is the one that uh, through the oral tradition uh, of certain people that they say that that was what the shell the shell that the creator blew through to bring life to the Anishinaabe and that this what I didn't get what I cut out of there was William Warren also talks about this shell appearing coming out of the ocean uh, at the Atlantic seaboard and then showing itself at different periods of time and it's tied to to the migration of, uh, of the Medewin from the eastern seaboard out to past Fond du Lac out to Treaty 3 area. And uh, I had the whole, I had to chop that whole thing off, basically. Uh, but I didn't look at the archaeology of when, when those particular uh, 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 shells enter and start coming, but they seem to predate uh, the other one. Maybe another question from in the room. Oh, great. So, I, I excuse my ignorance, but yesterday I wasn't here, and I know that there was a little bit of talk about the role of women uh, with regards to um, the clan mothers and wampum belts. But I, I wanted to ask you, both of you specifically, I didn't hear anything about um, the role of men and women in the manufacture uh, of the belts, but also the uh, thought thinking behind 
what goes into the belt to represent the words and then the present presentation of those belts and also the role of women in those councils uh, in terms of the land, the role of women in terms of land, uh, our, our role in, in caretaking the land and being the ones to have say. I just wanted to, to know if you could expand on that if you had any, any information. That's a, that's a great question. So my work has been pretty exclusively on um, on Anishinaabe histories, and I obviously read Great Lakes histories broadly too. Um, so uh, in the, I did mention the women's councils. So in Anishinaabe practices around um, uh, resource allocation, the women there was a women's council that played a really important role, and women were historically responsible for water and water resources, if that included fish, that included bulrushes, all the water plants. It also included sugar bushes, the sap and the man man managing that. So um, so decisions involving those resources involved the, the Mishnabe Women's Councils. Um, and you can see in that 1805 council I was mentioning, this is a, a, one of the, an example, and women are not often recognized represented it's really frustrating in the in the colonial archive like the British just didn't just wrote them out they were there they got written out so you have to keep imagining they're there because you know they're there but you know Quinevenu says that the, the 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 women are are upset with them for selling the land they say we're going to be worse off and but at the end of the day the land decision for the Anishinaabek rested with chief and council taking advice from the warriors and the council of women um, but in that context, they decided to uphold the alliance in the end. At the end, and so I think that must have been an extraordinary. You try to put your historian's hat on and imagine the, dis the difficult conversations that were clearly happening because of the, the press of, of settlers and women were absolutely there. And I think I thank you for the question because I think we ha all have to do a lot more work to write the women back in, right? You have to write them in. Thank you. Do you want to say anything? Uh, there's not much really more to say when you look at the, the actual archival record and like what Heidi was saying, uh, you really have to dig deep. But I'm excited to read a book that I, I didn't get to around to reading and it's by a, a colleague of mine, Rebecca Cudgel. And she was doing stuff on, uh, doing research for a long time on women at the councils, uh, camp councils, she was, she was calling them. So she just re released a book in 2023, I think it was called... Uh, Making Relatives, something like that. I forget the exact title. But uh, also, I, I just printed off uh, Christine Tsai's um, uh, thesis on maple sugar production and uh, women's role, not just in maple sugar, but that was the ca uh, test case. And then when Heidi mentioned the, the water and the, also the different uh, patches and ricing and stuff like that. So, But I don't have anything specific where... They said, like, uh, I think Darren mentioned um, Cattery was named as one of the wampum yeah. makers. I've never come across uh, them saying, uh, in, in actuality, I've got a document that says uh, a man made it, uh, the belt. I was just going to add, Madeline Waitung has a really lovely piece on Anishinaabe women's governance called Gendering Shoreline Law. If you haven't, haven't read it, I rec strongly recommend it. Hi there. I just wanted to comment too. There's a fascinating document on file, Library and Archives Canada, RG10. I don't have that particular <laughs> file number, but there's, it's at the height of the First World War. A group of clan mothers from Six Nations of the Grand River send a petition to King George V in England, um, essentially giving him a crash course in the history and culture of Six Nations wampum belt diplomacy. And at the same time, they're calling for that the king release certain Six Nations band members who have enlisted under age in, in, in the Canadian Expeditionary Force and other, uh, other formations of the British Army. And that's January the 30th of 1917. So it's uh, an interesting, you know, relatively recent invocation what the women what the clan mothers did was actually paste photographs one photo each of the two row wampum and one of the covenant chain belt pasting them to their full scap document that which was then mailed to the king and uh, explaining well this is the two row wampum this is what it means this is the covenant chain this is what it means and we demand that you release forthwith some of our young men who have enlisted under age in the the canadian expeditionary force so anyways, it's, it's out there. So. 
maybe I'll take one um, from folks participating online. Um, so Daniel Coleman asks, two wonderful presentations. Question for Heidi. If wampum was referred to as paper wampum after the War of 1812, do you know if people ever spoke of exchanging paper wampum at council meetings? That is, paper was prepared by both sides and exchanged. I haven't seen that, and I would say that the councils tended to be, um, uh, continued to be really oral places, right, where negotiations were happening, and you have these minutes that are clearly only capturing a very small percentage of what was said, and they certainly aren't capturing all the other kinds of conversations that are happening around the council fire or outside and, and after. So it is a really limited record. And I would say that I've, those are, you know, I gave those examples of paper wampum because I think it's it's important to think about the ways in which people were really trying to grab that, their crown allies hard and just whatever me medium they needed to still to get the message that you're not you're you're letting us down and you're not meeting your obligations. Um, but like I haven't, uh, I, I wouldn't say it was like a, a sharp transition because wampum still plays a role, and so do pipes. By the way, like even after the robertson huron treaty was signed like in the 1880s and i've seen letters that have come to indian agents or to ottawa they've sent to ottawa with pipes the paper went with the, the letter went with the pipe uh and of course then the pipe got presumably put in the museum's collections because it's not in you know it gets separated and they don't even document that it's just oh just put it over here and file the letter but the letter says that the pipe was included right so clearly people were still continuing to use these methods or putting the the picture of the belt on a letter to try to get the you know crown officials to remember their their legal obligation that like you want to use the word law but use their obligation to remember their obligations to their allies and their family to take care of um, to take care of people so it's a great question and I hope we'll find more okay we've got about four minutes left um, so we can maybe just take uh, one or two more depending on length well, folks are formulating. I just wanted to mention, um, maybe for the two of you just to be thinking while you're listening to these last question or two, uh, quite a number of folks mentioned they wanted one piece of follow-up or clarification. Something was obscured perhaps um, in the slides. So just to think about whether you might be interested in sharing them. Um, I won't ask again, but... Oh, share the slides. Yeah. Yeah, because of the, it was just... It was Meskwaki's dotum image from the, that's, that's the slide that got disappeared. It was, uh, but it's, yeah, we can, we can sure. I'll let you comment on it if you're interested okay. in doing so. Okay. Uh, Arneen, uh, I'm, my name is uh, Cameron Adams. So Cameron Adams, Natisne Um And I am curious, Heidi, you mentioned in your presentation a couple of things that kind of, I'm learning uh, my own language of Swampy Cree, so I'm really interested in your perspective on this. Um, about surrendered and seated, these were like kind of words that were used uh, as, and I'm curious about, we often talk about unseated versus seated and in the language of these documents and from a indigenous uh, worldview of spirit and intent. I was curious if you could elaborate more on how these perspectives kind of live and how as like a story and you like look through and kind of understand from a holistic perspective okay. what it, they kind of yeah i'm trying to explain <laughs> this but like how do you piece through to be able yeah. to understand like was this was this kind of uh, treaty something that first nations did say that okay here's the land we don't you know because they're yeah. purchasing it like i'm just uh yeah, yeah so i'm uh, um, happy to chat over lunch because it's a very large that's a big question there's a lot um a lot in it um you no know, right after the american revolution the the, the um I, I should say that right after the seven years war you know william johnson promised that the British only needed a small corner of the mat, uh, their mat, you know, only a small corner of their territory. But of course, after the American Revolution, what was left of British North America then became the target of, of settlement, white settlement and immigration. So it, it shifts markedly. There's a long, long history of land purchases, both with private actors and um, 
uh, the Dutch or the English going back to the very beginning of the 17th century. This isn't it? And Alan Greer is right there, has written a lovely book on this broader history of, of the use of this sort of property law, um, uh, possession and dispossession. So that can help. The deeds themselves are, um, what's so interesting about them, when you look at the treaties, when you go to Indian treaties and surrenders and you look at these, these pre-Confederation treaties, they are title deeds. Like I said, they're the same kind of document that two white farmers would use to sell land to each other. They're boilerplate texts and, and they, they, the different forms, one of the things I'm, I wonder about is like who, I'm looking at who's prepared each deed because there was a lot of different variation. It's not as standardized as today when you buy a condo or a house, right? Where you get the standard deed, there was a bunch of different forms. And so they were using these, these forms that were in common use, but the, the words of the treaty like they come in the council, then indigenous perspective is in the council and the council, that's why the minutes are so important, right? Because you see it there. If you just look at those deeds and unfortunately that's where a lot of litigation has gotten stuck, right? It just looks at those deeds as property law transactions and you have to move out of that. And the, the gifts are so important, right? It is so important that those treaties were paid with gifts. And you know, Haldeman um, was you know, setting up the Indian Department after the American Revolution, Governor Haldeman wrote a letter to the Post. This is an area of research I'm working on right now, which is really exciting. And he was just, he was looking at the, um, uh, the, the presents that they were giving and he was expressing concern about the number of gifts that Anishinaabe were bringing to posts and then the post commanders were taking privately or the food was going into private hands and it wasn't going to the credit of the crown. So it was a, an accounting problem. But what it tells you is that Anishinaabe people were showing up and gifting as well. They were, these, these councils weren't land transactions. They were, they were within the context of the Anishinaabe practice. And, and I wanna extend this you know, more broadly to look at like Haudenosaunee concepts too, because there are some deeds as well that involve Haudenosaunee and, and they are uh, similarly, these councils are oral, right? They're not, um, they're not the deed. So I hope that begins to answer the question. Yeah. We're just a couple minutes past time and I won't hold folks from their hungry bellies. Um, but I just wanted to say uh, how deeply appreciative I am of uh, the very careful work that the two of you do and say miigwech for sharing your gifts with us today and to everybody here for your wonderful questions. So Mia, that's it. Bonjour tout le monde. Bienvenue à ce troisième panel uh, Wampum et État colonial. Uh, je suis uh, Yann Allard Tremblay, professeur en sciences politiques à l'Université McGill. Je suis également le directeur de l'initiative en études autochtones et engagement communautaire, donc ISKE, um, the Indigenous Studies and Community Engagement Initiative de l'Université McGill, qui est financé par um, une subvention de la Fondation Mellon. Uh, ISKE, qui est, on voit le logo ici, dont on voit le logo ici, um, et a le plaisir de financer une petite partie de um, cet événement. C'est avec grand plaisir que nous le finançons. Uh, parce que cet événement contribue uh, aux études autochtones, mais également à une forme uh, excellente d'engagement communautaire où des chercheurs et des membres de communauté viennent ensemble pour parler uh, de Wampum. Donc, aujourd'hui, uh, dans ce troisième panel, nous aurons une présentation d'abord par Riley Wallace de l'Université McGill. Uh, Riley Wallace est un candidat au doctorat au département d'histoire et des études classiques de l'Université McGill. Son intérêt pour la mise en place de l'État impérial et les changements de régime l'a amené à se pencher sur le rôle des archives françaises en tant qu'élément de légitimité politique au Québec au lendemain de la conquête. Son projet de thèse, intitulé « Archives, gouvernance and the politics of information in post-conquest Quebec, 1759-1791 », a, lui a valu l'obtention de bourses doctorales du Conseil de recherche en sciences humaines du Canada et du Fonds de recherche du Québec, Société et culture. Nous aurons ensuite une présentation par Jacinthe Ledoux. Jacinthe Ledoux est membre du Barreau du Québec et du Barreau de l'Ontario. Avocate spécialisée en droit autochtone, Madame Ledoux a une pratique diversifiée qui comprend la représentation de Premières Nations en matière de droit de l'environnement, de revendications particulières, de droit de l'énergie, de ressources naturelles, de droits constitutionnels, de protection de la jeunesse et de droits de la personne. 
détentrice d'une maîtrise en Common Law canadienne de Osgood Hall Law School, Mme Ledoux a également obtenu une maîtrise en droit de l'environnement de l'Université McGill, ainsi qu'un baccalauréat en droit et un baccalauréat en études internationales, tous deux de l'Université de Montréal. Son mémoire, qui explore les interactions entre les ordres juridiques étatiques et autochtones à travers le prisme de la jurisprudence relative au, au wampum, a obtenu le prix du meilleur mémoire en droit du Québec. Donc, je laisse la place immédiatement à Riley. Hello. Um, so first off, I'd just like to say thank you very much for having me. Um, this is a great honor, and uh, I've really, really learned a lot from all the presentations so far given uh, this past couple of days. And I'd also like to recognize that we are on the traditional homelands of several indigenous peoples, including Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg. I myself am from Vanderhoof in British Columbia on unceded uh, Dekel carrier land. And I recognize that the, the topics of dispossession are not simply academic topics for indigenous peoples, especially for the people of Kenesatage, who I will talk about in this presentation, but an ongoing lived reality. So I hope my talk is uh, received as an attempt by a non-Indigenous Canadian historian to uh, shed some light on uh, this process. So, so after the fall of New France in 1760, the British were forced to confront Indigenous and French uh, claims to land. But what exactly was New France? So. New France was a continent spanning, spanning imperial claim, um, quite a weak imperial claim, but exercised through the relationships and alliances with indigenous peoples, through missionaries, military officers, and above all the fur trade. Um, yet Canada, which is the name that the French use for the settler dense colonial zone in the St. Lawrence Valley, um, is seen sort of here in the red. This is what the British carved out of New France to create the new province of Quebec so it's not surprising that, you know, where there's the 65,000 uh, roughly French Canadian settlers, the, they carved a new province out of it. And we know about the Royal Proclamation and the boundary line um, dividing the rest of, the, of New France. So yet, despite the apparent homogeneity presented in this like red interior, um, Canada had always been a multi-jurisdictional zone. Uh, the province of Quebec, created by the British, inherited Canada's multiple legal systems, layers of property, and conceptions of land use. On the one hand, there were, was the French property regime um, that you can see here in this map from 1709. Um, in this uh, system, seigneurs, both lay and religious, were granted lands on fief with the expectation that they would be conceded tracts of lands to peasants en sensive in return for some um, rents or feudal dues, such as uh, the corvée labor. This created a vertical relationship uh, from the peasant to the seigneur up to the king. Um, and colonization existed, of course, in the physical occupation of land, right? Um, but as this uh, map represents, it also existed as an abstraction on paper. Um, indeed, one of the main preoccupations of the colonial government was to supervise settlement through the creation of a large property archive that was centered at Quebec. Concession deeds represented potent political claims to indigenous space, which formed the backbone of Canada's legal system. So on the other hand, we have indigenous claims to land in this, uh, this territory. And beginning around the so-called Iroquois Wars, there is a uh, portions of the Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Abenaki began to move closer to French settlements um, for diplomatic, economic, and religious reasons. Uh, while maintaining their seasonal patterns of migration and their judicial independence, uh, the, these mission villages became further entangled in French colonial life, wars, and trade. Um, the religious orders, such as the Jesuits and the Sulpicians, uh, they had concessions on fief um, for these mission villages um, for the purpose of Christianizing the indigenous residents. And the terms of these concessions differed with some declaring the, the, the religious authorities, seigneurs, and outright, and others saying that they were holding the land in trust for indigenous people as long as the mission was there. Um, none of these indigenous communities, however, were subject to feudal dues. So they were not in the same sense considered censitaire like the French peasants. Um, and you can see here in this detail of a map from 1709 that they don't 
quite fit in so neatly with the the idealistic lines of the French seigneurial system, where it says Ab Abenaque. And for indigenous people, these concession deeds initially mattered little, um, as they did not consider their settling in territories that they had long frequented as being uh, based on the permission of the French king. Indigenous conceptions of their relation to land differed, as did the, the regard for the legitimacy of documentary legal instruments. However, both would come to a head during the British uh, regime. So we've heard quite a bit about this wampum, and uh, so, and people have probably seen it upstairs. Uh, it'll be the, the case study for my talk today. Um, the case of the two dog wampum uh, demonstrates the tensions at play and the messiness of the British regime change uh, with diverging conceptions of land use and property. On February 8th, 1788, the indigenous residents of Kinesitake at Lac de Montagne met with the superintendent of Indian affairs uh, to present a petition against the French Canadian settlers who had been taking uh, their land. Uh, Chief Agnita explained that the Sulpician priests who ran the mission had convinced them to leave their old village in order to settle at uh, Lac de Montagne on promise of having a, French, uh, a deed from the French king. And following the customs of their ancestors, he continued, they created this wampum belt and then they buried it below the earth so that no ill-intentioned Ill person would be able to find it. Um, and so they presented this wampum uh, to the superintendent of Indian affairs as proof of their ownership of the land. Now the Sulpicians uh, came back with their own uh, version of events and they contested the claim um, seven months later. In their defense, they presented the Legislative Council of Quebec with the paper titled deed to the seigneury, as well as a record of concessions to quote, disabuse them of their chimerical pretensions, which they assert without foundation. So not taking this wampum as any sort of proof. Um, they contested the two dog wampum's legal validity because Knesetake had quote, made the collier themselves um, and had not presented it to the Sulpicians. The committee of the legislative council that was tasked with, uh, you know, investigating the claim were no less kind to wampum as a legal instrument. In fact, the attorney general only spared a single line for the claim of the indigenous residents of Kinesitake. He said, with respect to the claim of title by the Indians of the Lake of the Two Mountains to the fief of that seigneury, whatever ideas they may have entertained of a title, we cannot procure any right in them. And uh, again, in 1797, we see another petition and Governor Dorchester responding and essentially telling, telling the residents again that um, I've set, they've sent the deed to them and said, you know, this is the deed from 1717. We're sorry you were deceived, but remember you were not deceived by a British, uh, British man, you were deceived by a Frenchman. So we can see here that there was, you know, a mental divide between two mediums of historical record, uh, wampum on the one hand and French archives on the other. And from you know a detached modern observer, this may seem sort of natural or understandable, but, but only when we don't really think about it too hard, because you know Western society sort of takes it for granted that documents held in archives with the right types of uh, marks of authenticity become like you know cornerstone legal documents and instruments, and indeed at a risk of like painting with too broad a brush, you know Western civilization in quotes has a shared history of archiving that does go back to medieval chanceries. So, you know, over hundreds of years, similar materials, ways of writing, and architectural forms came to constitute the vehicles for preserving authentic and legal historical evidence. So in this context, you know, why should we expect the British to have really considered the wampum at all, right? Um, this is very problematic because, you know, as excellent work by people like Jonathan Lainey, Jonathan Lainey Alan Corbier, John Boros, and you know a lot of the work that we've heard this uh, past couple of days shows the French and British colonizers absolutely they recognize the absolute necessity of using wampum in international relations with indigenous people of northeastern North America, and the colonial historical record itself was is filled with so many allusions to wampum as a type of record or annals uh, contract and even archives. And showing that these Euro Americans were trying to sort of domesticate wampum within their own mental universe. The Jesuit missionary Lafito, who spent many years at Kanawake, likened wampum to conserved in their longhouses to a public treasury. Um, and, you know, there's even syncretism that we see with wampum that has alphabetic script, like the, um, the 1764 Covenant Belt, 
the stains at Niagara or the votive wampum belts that are sent to religious communities. And finally, Europeans transcribed the parole or the speeches that they had with indigenous people and referred to specific wampum. So, you know, they're very familiar with wampum. Um, and, you know, still scholars today, they generally move away from using these kind of crude categories of uh, analogy because it sort of it distorts the true meaning of wampum, um, which is, you know, more than a, just a mnemonic device. It is a sacred item that constitutes like the living embodiment of a relationship. And I would also like to avoid the pitfalls of analogy, um, but so I wouldn't fully equate archives and wampum together. However, uh, attention to the social situatedness of wampum, it's, a, its existence in a relationship, I think dovetails kind of nicely with how historians have been talking about the history of archives recently. Um, so historians who see archives as more than just these sources of information that we mine um, have looked at the ways that they are constructed things, right, that exist in social, political, material, and intellectual um, environments. And there's, you know, there's relationships behind the repeated use of archives. Because what are documents without people to view them? Uh, what are archives without knowledge pe knowledgeable people to order and interpret them? And can archives actually exist outside of these networks? Um, I argue no. And so the purpose of my paper, which I'm getting to at 10 minutes in, <laughs> is that um, the legal valorization of the archives that the Sulpicians depend on after the conquest uh, was not just a straightforward process. Um, it was a, it was a process, yes. Um, so identifying, collecting, cataloging, and deploying what they called the ancient French archives relied on constant administrative will and government resources. My point is that the devaluation, devaluation of wampum as legal ev evidence following the conquest was not simply preordained on an epistemological level, on the level of worldviews or knowledge systems, um, but was a product of administrative decisions and only the gradual integration of archives into this post-conquest legal system. So before the British began to bombard the city of Quebec in 1759, before, you know, the famous battle of Wolf and, uh, Wolf and what's his name, you know? <laughs> Montcalm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, on the Plains of Abraham, uh, the Governor General of Canada, Vaudreuil, spirited the government archives out of the city. And a year later, when he was surrendering at Montreal to Gener Jeff General Jeffrey Amherst, um, a bunch of these articles and clauses had to do with what was going to happen with governments from the old regime. And you can see here it says from the capitulation, um, accorder except les archives qui pourront être nécessaires pour le gouvernement du pays. So uh, any government, any papers that are related to the government of the country have to stay in the country. And generally this means um, documents relating to property and the courts. So in total, nine of the 48 articles of capitulation dealt with the fate of documents. And to me, it seems that the business of conquering was not just the, you know, the surrender of arms, but also the surrender of these papers. And you might be thinking now it's sort of anachronistic to be talking about conquest when talking about indigenous people as well, because of course, um, these indigenous people of St. Lawrence Valley signed separate treaties with the British um, at Oswagachi, Kanawake, and Wendake in 1760. And also they were not subjects of the French king. Um, and so they were, you know, judicially independent. But the title of my paper is purposeful in two respects, because seeing uh, implies that there's a processing of information going on and seeing like a conquering state is because the, the British saw how they were going to govern in Quebec through this lens of a legal category of conquest. So this is a, a term from the law of nations at the time in the 18th century. So a lot of what they're doing is using these records to, um, to govern through this laws of continuity. Um, and that becomes through, is justified through the laws of conquest. So, but ascertaining the laws that, um, that were in play in Quebec, the province of Quebec, before it became the province of Quebec, uh, was not super straightforward. It required local knowledgeable people and the seizure of those sources of law. The valorization of French property rights through archival documents was a process that was always in the making. And you can see this 
in the journals of the Legislative Council when they're constantly um, trying to get French property owners to deposit their records with them in a new registry. And this doesn't, um, most of the French property owner, owners don't comply. Um, you see it also in the inventories that are made periodically from the clerks of the council, the secretaries. You know, each time a new governor comes in, he tries to ascertain what documents are, are there. And when there's a, you know, a new clerk, he has to do the same thing. There isn't like a streamlined bureaucracy at this point. Um, so there's no rules of like handling documents. And so things can get lost, right? So there's, you know, I found th three different inventories, one made in the first one from 1767. Um, which was a part of, you know, the government trying to figure out what French laws were in play. Then there is another one in 1778 after the Quebec Act, and another under Governor Haldeman in 1783 after the American Revolution. But the biggest investigation came in 1788, um, when Governor Dorchester, like, he had a committee set up, and they did this big, long investigation into the ancient French archives. And at the end of it, they published... Um, they published the minutes of those meetings. Uh, they made 700 copies and they sent them to different magistrates throughout the province uh, in order to, if I can find the wording here. Mm -hmm. um, so as may be necessary and useful for the information of the public. And in 1790, they passed an, order in, an ordinance for the better preservation of the ancient French records. So my point is basically that you know, from the conquest up until the end of the period that I study, uh, there's this need of constant need for the administration to valorize these archives and use them. Um, it's not something that just happens. Um, and in the con, like they become important for answering several questions, um, especially related to land. So after the war, for example, there are French and Canadians who are demanding that their their land rights to land be recognized, and two very big uh, administrative people from new, the New France period, uh, the intendant Hocard and the governor Vaudreuil demand that they had these grants, one on the Labrador coast and one in this massive, massive grant uh, in the Michelin-Mackinac region be recognized. Um, but James Murray, the first governor of Quebec, uh, told his superiors that neither were ever registered at the con uh, Conseil Supérieur of Quebec, which form under the French government was absolutely necessary to validate every act of the kind, though under the king's own signature. So here he's talking about some of the French archives that were seized. And how did he kind of understand how the French archives operated and administrative procedure? Well, he had a Canadian named Jean-Claude Panet who was working for him. And during the military regime, so those four years of like 1759 to 63, um, Panet was also operating as the chief clerk of his court, the, mil the military court of appeals, which Murray called, not coincidentally, uh, the Superior Council. So there's this continuity going on. And Jean-Claude Panet had access to the records kind of as he would, as he needed to. Um, aside from Panet, uh, the turn to local knowledge was most uh, exemplified by Jean-Francois Cugnet, this man here. Um, he was a son of a high-ranking official during the French regime, and he uh, was also trained in the law. During the investigation into French laws in the 1760s, he made several abstracts of seigneurial concessions, um, and the surveyor general was not exactly super happy with these abstracts, complaining that when he actually went out onto the sorry, uh, went out onto the land, uh, they did not match up, and so he was complaining uh, about that. And so again, I think it shows that, you know, the the abstract lines, the concession deeds um, do not really match up to reality. Um, it's a more complex reality. After the Quebec Act um, in 1774, which recognized officially Canadian law as supposedly the law of the province, um, you know, he's, he's made this clerk of the terrars, or the greffe du papier terrier. This is kind of bringing about an old French position um, and suiting it for the new British regime as it's trying to, you know, use the French records and get a better idea of the, of the, the property system. Um, and you can see here his notes on the, this, uh, the Seigneury of Lac de de Montagne. You probably can't see it, but essentially he's saying the Sulpicians have such and such rights and the king has such and such rights. Um, and nowhere in there does, it, does he mention the indigenous people, right? So he's a pivotal figure in this. 
Uh, and the, the Quebec government also called, uh, resurrected an old practice and called all the seigneurs to make fealty and homage at the castle of St. Louis in 1778. What this meant was that they would present titles um, and then they would also give economic and demographic information about their property. Um, so here we see another opportunity for Can Canadians to secure their property under the British eyes of the British government and also for the British government to sort of make its own archival or property archive. Um, and during the, the American Revolution, it was seen as also a way to get um, to secure loyalty from French Canadians. Um, so British administrative activity did operate on multiple levels, um, calls to protect Canadian property, the desire to discover what belonged to the royal, royal patrimony, and the colonization of new lands pushed them to search these ancient French records and to construct new archives themselves. Um, the Sulpicians were involved in these processes. They did present their titles in 1764 to be registered, and they did swear the Fuyoma, the fealty and homage, in 1781. Um, and then during that process, the dispute with Kinestake, they recalled both of those as proof that the British government had recognized them. And, um, but it wasn't, uh, you know, completely straightforward either that they would be recognized. The Attorney General, who made the same report where he only had one line to spare for Kinestake, spent, you know, five pages essentially disagreeing with the validity of those acts, because to him, this was a foreign religious community that should have gave up its property rights at the conquest, right? So, um, so it's kind of interesting that uh, the legislative council completely ignores his uh, his opinion and decides to go with this property archive that has been created since the conquest and the old records themselves. Right. So coming up on my conclusion. Good. Um, so from the decision to keep French property records in the province at the capitulation of Montreal, oh, there we go, um, to the multiple investigations into the ancient French archives and the repeated efforts of British officials to co-op local knowledge, it is clear that the case of the two dog wampum is more complex than simply just one form of record being privileged over another. Um, yes, offic British officials did come from, come from a culture where property deeds uh, were more from a culture in which archival documents were deemed the correct mode of legally recording property, yet just as our understanding of wampum is incomplete without attention to its production and circulation, we should not remove the archives from the social, intellectual, material, and political context that give them meaning. After a violent regime change in a province where the laws were uncertain, Canadians and British officials worked together to imbue these ancient French archives with meaning. Legal interpretations depended partly on a shared worldview partly on local knowledge and absolutely on the material existence of these uh, records and their transfer from, Brit from French to British hands. The outcome in Canada was thus the result of a contingent process. And just as an aside, you can think about in the French Revolution, one of the first things that happens in the, the chaos is that um, the peasants seize seigneur archives and burn them so they can forever, uh, you know, obliviate that relationship. So we have a very opposite situation in, in, this, in this case. Um, in order to understand the multiple legal orders that have histor historically existed in what became Canada and continue to be a point of reference for many people, I believe we have to appreciate the archives' ability to silence the past and the compounding impacts of archival violence in settler colonial states. Thank you. Bonjour. Merci euh, d'abord aux organisateurs vraiment de, de m'avoir invité. Je suis très honorée, contente d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui. Je vais laisser euh, le temps à tout le monde de mettre euh, ses écouteurs pour avoir accès à la traduction. Il y a des chances que je parle un peu franglais, donc euh, peut-être que par moment euh, vous aurez accès à l'opportunité d'enlever vos écouteurs pour entendre euh, la présentation un peu en anglais. Donc, euh, je, je remercie aussi euh, le, le peuple Odenoshoni, Onkwehonwe, les Anishinaabe, euh, tous les peuples qui ont, euh, qui ont partagé ce territoire et de, 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 de m'inviter aussi aujourd'hui ici. Et euh, 
vous allez voir, la présentation que je m'apprête à faire est un peu peut-être différente de ce que vous avez entendu jusqu'à maintenant. J'ai été vraiment fascinée, en fait, d'entendre la richesse des perspectives qui ont été partagées plus tôt aujourd'hui, hier, des perspectives historiques, des perspectives vécues, des perspectives euh, qui sont vécues par les communautés. Et j'espère que ma présentation ne sera pas la plus déprimante de celle que vous aurez entendue pendant ces deux derniers jours, parce que euh, je vais, je m'intéresse moi à la façon dont les wampum puis les ordres, les traditions juridiques autochtones sont euh, présentés, accueillis, ignorés, exclus par les tribunaux canadiens aujourd'hui. Cette présentation, elle est pertinente parce que depuis les années 80, les wampum ont été présentés dans plus d'une quarantaine de causes devant les tribunaux canadiens. Elles ont, les, les wampums sont plaidés par les partis autochtones, parfois pour soutenir des faits, parfois pour soutenir des droits, dans une très vaste variété de domaines, par exemple en droit fiscal, en droit familial, en droit criminel, en droit pénal, constitutionnel et en droit de la personne. Et c'est l'analyse de ce corpus de décision et de jurisprudence que je propose de faire avec vous. Cette analyse, elle est à la fois déprimante et fascinante parce qu'elle permet de prendre le, le pouls de l'état de nos relations. Elle permet de saisir comment ce dialogue entre les traditions juridiques autochtones et étatiques, de quoi il a l'air aujourd'hui en 2024 ce n'est pas toujours beau, voilà pourquoi je vous avertis d'avance, mais il y a du changement et je dirais beaucoup d'optimisme et d'espoir parce que le droit est en mouvement comme nos sociétés. Je voudrais aussi remercier Arwin Corpierre, je ne sais pas s'il est toujours là, mais c'est grâce à lui que j'ai entrepris ce sujet de recherche. Il faisait une conférence à l'Indigenous Bar Association il y a quelques années et voilà que ça m'a lancé dans une, une recherche qui m'habite encore aujourd'hui. On va commencer par regarder ensemble quels wampum, lesquels sont présentés devant les tribunaux. Vous verrez qu'il y a une petite variété de wampum qui sont présentés. Ce ne sont pas tous les wampum. Généralement, ce sont ceux qui ont été échangés avec les peuples européens, soit Deutsch, Français, Britannique, et euh, voilà. Et on verra ensuite dans quel contexte ils sont présentés pour soutenir quoi, quel genre de principe, quel genre de fait et comment les tribunaux les accueillent ou pas. Et finalement, on terminera en faisant quelques constats et réflexions sur l'avenir de nos relations. Alors, quels wampum sont invoqués devant les tribunaux canadiens? Il y a euh, les branches de wampum euh, qui sont euh, invoquées généralement, on le verra plus tard, euh, pour soutenir des, des faits. Alors, euh, le, les, les branches de wampum, et euh, je les mettrais presque dans la même catégorie que les wampum indéterminés. Parfois, ils sont présentés euh, sans qu'on sache exactement quel était le wampum, sa description, son motif. Euh, euh, J'ai pas vraiment mis d'image ici parce que les, les wampum euh, dont il est question sont des messages dont le message euh, sont des, des wampum dont le message et la voix se sont perdus au fil du temps. Alors il reste seulement la mémoire de leur échange, ce qui a quand même un effet au niveau juridique. On le verra tantôt. La grande vedette des wampum invoqués devant les tribunaux canadiens, le wampum Adervois, la Goswenta, est sans contredit le wampum qui gagne la médaille d'or. Il est le majoritairement celui qui est le plus souvent euh, mentionné, le plus souvent plaidé. Il est aussi malheureusement celui qui est le plus souvent distorsionné interprété de façon, enfin, vous en jugerez par vous-même, et même ignoré. Alors, souvent, il est plaidé, mais il n'apparaît ensuite nulle part dans l'analyse juridique. Alors, le wampum à deux voix, cette grande vedette qui, malheureusement, n'a pas toujours gain de cause, mais que ça bouge, ça bouge. Ensuite, le wampum du Vatican, 
euh, dont on a parlé hier, euh, qui était absolument euh, fascinant, euh, la richesse en fait de la présentation d'hier par rapport à la façon dont c'est traité par les tribunaux. Donc le wampum du Vatican et j'ai ajouté euh, ici avec, euh, j'ajouterai l'aimable permission de Stephen Augustine, je trouvais pas de, de photos là seulement du wampum du Vatican, alors on est ici la reproduction qui a été euh, faite par euh, notre, notre invité. Euh, Ensuite, on a le wampum de la chaîne d'alliance, Covenant Chain Wampum, qui, est, euh, qui a été échangé pendant le traité de Niagara. Ce wampum a énormément de potentiel constitutionnel pour faire bouger certaines interprétations qui parfois, ça c'est juste mon avis personnel, hein, qui parfois nous, nous enferment dans une certaine vision de, de ce qu'est la constitution canadienne. Alors énormément de, de potentiel pour le, le wampum de, de la chaîne d'alliance. Puis on, on le verra aussi tantôt, il y a certaines décisions qui ouvre, commence à créer certaines brèches qui sont fascinantes. Et euh, les Wampum Odenoshoni, je, vraiment, je demande pardon déjà d'avance de les avoir mis tous ensemble, mais ils sont chacun d'eux extrêmement riches. La qualité des photos vient du genre de photos euh, qui euh, apparaît dans le jugement Montour, qui est un jugement qui a été rendu par la Cour euh, euh, supérieure du Québec en novembre ou décembre dernier, bref, fin 2023, une décision dont on parlera dans quelques instants. Et euh, tous ces Wampum, the Circle Wampum, the Wampum of the, of the Three Chiefs Holding Tight, the Two Nations Wampum Belt, the Covenant Chain Belt, ont tous été plaidés pour euh, faire valoir la perspective Odenoshoni, le droit Odenoshoni, et influencer finalement la décision euh, assez, euh, j'allais dire révolutionnaire, mais je dirais pas jusque-là, mais une décision, une décision très importante euh, qui, qui change un peu le, le cours des choses là, dans, dans mon tour. Alors déjà, c'est tout. Il n'y a pas d'autres wampum pour le moment qui ont été plaidés ou soumis devant les tribunaux canadiens. Alors quand vous allez dans l'exposition un peu plus haut, euh, aujourd'hui ou, ou hier, enfin j'essaie de voir le temps, euh, eh bien, le, le nombre de wampum qu'on voit qui sont montrés à l'exposition est beaucoup plus large, beaucoup plus important que la, 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 la minime quantité de wampum qui est présentée devant les tribunaux. Alors, comment ils sont euh, accueillis, interprétés, quel genre de, de valeur normative ils ont dans le processus judiciaire canadien? Donc, devant les tribunaux, ils sont euh, généralement, quand il est question de faire des adaptations procédurales, les wampum sont bien accueillis. Alors, par exemple, une partie autochtone dans un litige peut demander à faire le serment de dire toute la vérité sur un wampum. C'est possible de le faire. Et les adaptations à la loi sur la preuve au Canada ont été, en fait, il n'y a pas de modification législative, mais les tribunaux le font et il y a maintenant des précédents. J'ai aussi entendu entre les branches euh, que des wampum ont été présentés euh, pendant l'audience et qu'ils ont servi de présence pendant toute la durée d'une audience. Par contre, je n'ai pas eu de confirmation. Je pense que c'était dans l'affaire Restall en Ontario. Euh, et je serais intéressée si vous avez des informations là-dessus. Ils ont été présentés finalement comme des, des êtres qui avaient en fait une histoire et qui pouvaient influencer seulement par leur présence le cours des délibérations qui étaient en cours. Finalement, c'était comme une présence sacrée dans la pièce. Euh, mais je n'ai pas de confirmation parce que le jugement lui-même n'en fait pas mention. Alors, il faudrait que j'aille chercher des transcriptions pour avoir plus d'informations là-dessus. Prochaine fois. Les wampums sont aussi invoqués pour soutenir la mémoire ou la tradition orale des témoins autochtones qui viennent parler de euh, la mémoire de leur communauté. Et ça, c'est là que le droit n'est pas très accueillant. Il n'est pas très accueillant parce que le wampum qui est invoqué comme soutien à la parole ou la mémoire euh, orale des communautés est reçu par les tribunaux comme un soutien pour appuyer des faits. Et les tribunaux font en quelque sorte une sorte de... de ils vont analyser la crédibilité du témoin en allant confronter sa mémoire avec les archives documentaires. Et cet exercice n'est pas tellement approprié 
à l'analyse du contenu normatif des wampum. Parce que si ce qui est pertinent, c'est le message ou la parole, le principe qui incarne le wampum, alors aller y chercher des faits historiques avec des dates précises, des moments vraiment, vraiment précis, un peu comme un témoignage de quelqu'un qui raconte une histoire qui s'inscrit dans une trame factuelle extrêmement précise. Alors à ce moment-là, euh, le, le wampum est, est, est traité finalement comme une source presque d'imprécision dans ce cas-ci. C'était l'affaire Marshall, euh, l'affaire Marshall où euh, des 35 membres de, de Nations Mi'kmaq avaient été accusés d'avoir prélevé du bois illégalement sur des terres publiques et où la défense de la communauté était de faire valoir un titre ancestral sur ce territoire. Et euh, à ce moment-là, le témoignage de, de, de Chief Stephen Augustine était, était là pour montrer l'ancienneté des liens qui unissent les Mi'kmaq à leurs territoires ancestraux, euh, pour faire la preuve finalement de ce titre ancestral. Et la Cour, euh, avec l'expertise de Vander Peet, qui était pour la Couronne, est allé euh, chercher finalement une, d'après le juge, une montagne de, 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 de documentation pour euh, finalement contredire le témoignage de, de Stephen Augustine et ça a fait en sorte que la crédibilité de son témoignage a été euh, écartée ou enfin grandement diminuée. Alors, je le répète, ce qui pose ici problème, c'est aussi le fait de traiter les porteurs de la parole des Wampum comme des témoins ordinaires, plutôt que comme des experts, par exemple. Alors, une, une voie de solution potentielle, ça pourrait être de leur reconnaître un statut d'expert. Ensuite, un autre enjeu, puis quand on fait du droit comparé et qu'on regarde ce qui se passe dans d'autres juridictions à travers le monde, on réalise que la structure des tribunaux est parfois modifiée pour que des juges autochtones soit en délibéré avec les juges non autochtones et qu'ainsi le dialogue entre les ordres juridiques autochtones et les ordres juridiques étatiques se passe au niveau des juges même qui discutent ensemble de quelles normes appliquer plutôt que d'avoir un juge non autochtone qui traite une autorité au sein de la communauté autochtone comme un simple témoin qui rapporte des faits. De façon intéressante, dans une autre affaire euh, au Chapoache, qui est euh, plutôt une question de, de droit fiscal, c'est une question de paiement de taxes pour un réseau de ski qui appartenait à la communauté euh, Chapoache. Et euh, dans ce cas-ci, c'était l'absence de wampum qui a, été, euh, qui a été utilisé comme un élément pour euh, miner la crédibilité du témoignage des aînés. Alors, les aînés sont venus témoigner de la mémoire orale de la communauté et le juge, a déterminé que l'absence de wampum, l'absence d'outils mnémoniques, était en fait euh, une, un élément qui minait la crédibilité du témoin. Comment est-ce que sa mémoire pouvait être fiable s'il n'y avait pas de relecture du contenu normatif des wampum à travers le temps? Alors finalement, euh, « damned if you do, damned if you don't », si tu as un wampum, ta crédibilité peut être minée parce qu'on le traite comme un fait. Si tu n'en as pas, ta crédibilité peut aussi être minée parce que tu n'as pas d'assise pour appuyer ta mémoire. Bref, les wampum pour appuyer des faits, pour le moment, ça n'a pas eu beaucoup de succès. Ensuite, pour prouver l'existence d'un traité protégé par l'article 35 de la loi constitutionnelle de 1982, euh, en fait, l'existence d'un traité, c'est d'après l'affaire Siwi, c'est la reconnaissance du euh, traité Huron-Britannique avec les Wendat. Euh, il y a trois éléments à prouver selon le droit canadien. Il faut prouver hein, qu'il y a eu un échange solennel avec l'intention de créer des obligations contraignantes entre des représentants ayant la capacité suffisante. Et le wampum intervient au moment de l'échange solennel. Le simple fait, et c'est là qu'on a des wampum anonymes ou des branches de wampum, où le simple fait de mentionner dans les archives qu'il y a un échange de wampum suffit à démontrer qu'il y avait un élément de solennité. Et ça permet parfois de transformer un simple contrat, a deed, pour refaire un lien avec la présentation un peu plus tôt, en un traité. Alors, il faut évidemment les deux autres éléments, mais l'élément solennel est prouvé par le wampum. Alors, encore une fois, ici, l'échange est reçu comme un fait, 
Alors, le test juridique est établi par la Cour. Donc, l'échange est reçu comme un fait. On ne s'attarde pas nécessairement au contenu de la parole portée par le Wampum. Euh, il est réduit à son aspect procédural, factuel. On ne s'intéresse pas nécessairement à son contenu normatif. Par contre, et c'est là qu'il y a quand même un peu d'espoir, de, 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 je dirais, ou de, de bonnes nouvelles, c'est que la jurisprudence récente, euh, par exemple dans l'affaire Montour, puis dans l'affaire Restool, qu'on va voir dans quelques instants, euh, commence, et ça c'est une bonne nouvelle, commence à s'intéresser au contenu normatif des Wampum, à quel Wampum était échangé pour essayer de déterminer quelle était l'intention des parties au moment de l'échange. Et c'est là que ça devient beaucoup plus intéressant, parce que ça donne à ces wampum échanger un statut constitutionnel, c'est-à-dire qu'ils font partie maintenant de la réflexion des juges et des tribunaux pour déterminer quelle était l'intention, donc quel est le contenu de euh, ce traité. Et euh, le, à ce moment-là, les wampum peuvent avoir une influence très importante. Alors, dans euh, l'affaire Montour, qui est présentement, euh, qui a été rendue, comme je le disais, il y a quelques mois, là, euh, par la Cour euh, euh, supérieure du Québec et qui est présentement en appel, qui s'en va en appel à la Cour d'appel du Québec et plusieurs disent que ça va probablement se rendre à la Cour suprême. Alors, on a du temps. Euh, mais euh, c'est les, les, les wampum qui ont été donc mentionnés euh, sur la chaîne d'alliance euh, en particulier ont servi à, euh, à reconnaître d'abord l'existence d'un méta-traité. C'est une nouvelle chose, le méta-traité de la chaîne d'alliance, et aussi à convenir que ce méta-traité contient en lui-même un mécanisme de résolution des conflits, Alors, basé sur la perspective Odenoshoni. Dans Restore, euh, une décision qui est présentement aussi en appel à la Cour suprême, on est en attente d'un jugement. Il s'agissait de euh, déterminer si des traités contenus avec les peuples Anishinaabe qui contenaient des annuités, est-ce que les annuités devaient être euh, euh, indexées jusqu'à aujourd'hui? Est-ce que le montant devait être ajusté pour refléter la modernité parce que les montants avaient été gelés? Et pour ça, il faut s'intéresser nécessairement à la perspective des partis au moment de la signature ou enfin de l'échange de, la, de, de, de paroles qui ont mené à la conclusion de ces traités. Puis peut-être ça vaut la peine de lire « From the Anishinaabe perspective, the central goal of the treaty was to renew their relationship with the crown, which was grounded in the covenant chain alliance and visually represented on wampum belts with images of two figures holding hands as part of two links in a chain. » Alors on a ici le wampum de la chaîne d'alliance qui euh, implique le respect, la responsabilité, la réciprocité, le renouvellement des relations. Et c'est avec cette intention de mouvement qui provient de la perspective Anishinaabe que la Cour conclut que les annuités doivent être indexées et que les dommages doivent donc être, euh, entre autres, versés. Encore une fois, c'est en appel à la Cour suprême. Alors, on attend de voir comment ce sera... Euh, traité. Alors, pour soutenir le droit à l'autodétermination et la non-ingérence, la Goswenta, le Wampum à deux voix, qui est le plus souvent échangé devant les tribunaux, il est invoqué généralement par des plaignants qui se représentent seuls, qui refusent de faire affaire avec un avocat parce que l'avocat est considéré comme un agent de l'État et que la juridiction de l'État ici est au cœur de la contestation qui est menée par le plaignant autochtone devant les tribunaux. Alors, ils font valoir euh, l'absence de juridiction des tribunaux canadiens à leur égard. Ils font aussi valoir leur droit à l'autodétermination en invoquant le Turo Wampum, mais aussi en invoquant souvent la proclamation royale, le traité de Niagara, euh, d'autres instruments. Et certains vont même demander une extradition, alors le vocabulaire du droit international, pour demander à être extradés dans leur communauté pour être jugés en fonction de leur propre loi de la guerre. Il va falloir m'aider peut-être pour la prononciation. Alors, comment est-ce que c'est reçu? Euh, en fait, euh, c'est reçu de, de façon... Je, je voulais copier ici parce que ce, ce jugement, en fait, il est, il est repris. Et il, y a, il y a beaucoup de jurisprudence nouvelle sur euh, ce, le, le rejet, en fait, de ces revendications. Euh, de, de la façon de plaider le, le tour au wampum. Les tribunaux canadiens, en fait, refusent systématiquement 
avec ce genre de plaidoirie, ils refusent systématiquement de remettre en question leur propre juridiction. Parce que acquiescer à l'idée d'une extradition, acquiescer à l'idée qu'ils n'ont pas juridiction, que l'État canadien n'a pas juridiction, ferait en sorte que ça viendrait toucher l'idée de la souveraineté canadienne. Or, ici, la souveraineté canadienne est affirmée sans nuance comme étant euh, une réalité. Or, même pas un concept, même pas euh, une souveraineté, euh, la certitude où il y a eu une assertion. On parle vraiment, c'est une réalité. Alors, c'est une vision monolithique de l'idée de l'État qui est finalement euh, utilisée pour euh, contrer ce, ce genre de, de demande. On a ici... Euh... Ah oui, ça c'est l'affaire... Euh, je ne sais pas si je vois pas bien, je m'excuse. Oui, euh, dans l'affaire Mitchell... Il était question aussi de traverser la frontière euh, canado-américaine et d'avoir le, le droit ancestral de traverser cette frontière. Le wampum à Durand, la, la Goswenta, est, est invoqué aussi pour euh, expliquer à la cour la vision de, du peuple des Nochoni. Et voici comment le juge répond. En fait, dans un grand élan de, de, de distorsion, euh, le wampum à deux voix devient l'incarnation d'une souveraineté fusionnée. Alors, on passe ici, finalement, de l'image de la rivière de la vie avec les deux euh, vaisseaux, c'est-à-dire le, le bateau des Britanniques et le, le canot des peuples autochtones, qui devient, sous euh, la plume du, du juge en question, qui devient le navire de l'État où euh, la souveraineté fusionnée euh, est représentée par euh, les Français qui sont, on ne sait pas lesquels, mais bref, les, les Français, les Britanniques et les peuples autochtones qui sont ensemble. Et, et comme dans un bateau, il y a le bois, le fer, la toile qui demeurent distincts, mais qui sont ensemble sur le même bateau étatique. Car on, on se retrouve tous sur le même bateau, finalement. Et <rire> il n'y a plus de, de distinction. Et les principes de paix, d'amitié, de réciprocité qui doivent guider nos relations sont euh, tout à coup euh, écartés. On est tous euh, ensemble, fusionnés ensemble. Euh... Oui, c'est un one-way, one pomme one exactement. <rire> euh, une petite lueur de... de de changement ici dans une décision rendue en 2023. Vraiment, 2023, c'est une belle année pour les, la reconnaissance des, des ordres juridiques autochtones devant les tribunaux pour un peu de, de mouvement. Euh, il y avait donc euh, un, une, une accusation au criminel et c'était une question de savoir si des conditions allaient être appliquées pour une libération conditionnelle d'un accusé euh, au dénonchoni. Et ce, dans cet article le, du Code criminel, je ne l'ai pas reproduit ici, mais on fait référence au public, à l'intérêt public. Le juge doit se demander, est-ce que c'est dans l'intérêt public d'assortir cette libération de conditions ou non? Et le juge se demande, mais qui est le public dans ce cas-ci? arrive à la conclusion que le public, c'est le peuple Odenoshoni, s'intéresse aux lois, aux droits Odenoshoni, et arrive à la conclusion que sous le droit Odenoshoni, cette personne n'était pas un criminel parce qu'il était en train de défendre son territoire. Et que la défense du territoire, en vertu du droit Odenoshoni, en fait c'est cette loi, ce droit qu'il défendait. Et la juge, le juge... Euh, en fait, est d'accord pour appliquer le droit au Denishoni dans l'interprétation de l'article 730 du Code criminel. Il y a à peine 3-4 ans, ce genre de jugement était complètement inexistant. Il reste une minute. <rire> Et nous avons déjà fait le tour de la jurisprudence qui, où les, les wampum sont invoqués. Quelques constats pour, pour l'avenir. En ce moment, le, le, le Canada vit dans ce qu'on appelle un pluralisme juridique de subordination, c'est-à-dire que l'ordre juridique étatique euh, agit euh, de, comme s'il était d'une certaine façon supérieur aux ordres juridiques autochtones. Euh, et dans cette relation de subordination, il y a une quête de reconnaissance et une quête vers aussi un pluralisme juridique qu'on appelle de coordination, où on vit ensemble, en fait, où on vit ensemble sur le même pied et où on doit plutôt parler des termes de notre coexistence. 
Alors, je vous ai mis à gauche, ça c'est l'arbre vivant de la Constitution canadienne. La Constitution canadienne, depuis, euh, depuis l'arrêt Edwards en 1930, est conçue pour, comme un arbre qui change, qui évolue, qui grandit. Remarquez que cet arbre, en ce moment, on ne voit pas ses racines. On ne voit pas ses racines en partie parce que les racines de l'arbre de la Constitution canadienne, et ça c'est mon avis, se trouvent dans les ordres juridiques autochtones. En ce moment, la couronne a une souveraineté de facto, alors que les communautés autochtones ont une souveraineté en droit, parce qu'ils étaient là d'abord. De plus, dans le dernier jugement de la Cour suprême qui a été rendu il y a deux semaines, le renvoi relatif à la loi concernant les enfants, les jeunes, les familles, les premières nations, c'est 92. Alors, c'est 92. La, la Cour suprême arrive avec une nouvelle métaphore pour parler de notre coexistence. Elle parle de, d'une tresse où il y aurait les normes de droit international, la Déclaration des Nations Unies sur les droits des peuples autochtones, le droit étatique et les ordres juridiques autochtones qui sont tressés ensemble. Et ça, c'est intéressant. Ça fait grandir l'arbre de la Constitution canadienne dans une direction qui nous amène plus près d'une relation, de, j'espère, d'amitié et de paix. Voilà, c'est la tresse. <rire> Merci. Je vais commencer par inviter des questions euh, de la salle ici. Question ou réaction? Ou, euh, est-ce qu'en ligne, il y avait des commentaires? Qui... Je laissais un, un peu de temps euh, pour briser la glace, mais euh, <rire> oui, il y avait des questions en ligne. Je peux, tu peux commencer tout de suite avec une question pour Riley. Euh, par rapport aux, aux articles de capitulation, Um, est-ce qu'il y a des mentions des wampum? Uh, et s'il y a de telles mentions, est-ce que c'est noté um, comment le régime britannique allait accepter ces wampum ou les refuser ou c'est simplement pas considéré? Uh, there's no mention of wampum specifically in the articles of capitulation, but there is article 40 of the capitulation, which says that um, the lands of the indigenous allies will be protected. So that kind of goes in accordance with, there's also the treaties at Aswagachi and uh, Kanawake and Wendake. Um, and those are recalled often enough by indigenous people as well, but no mention of wampum. And I might say also that, um, you know, Jonathan Lenny has shown that when the French um, were in this, this area, they had in the King's store was where they kept their wampum. And so there's sort of the separation between, you know, a document archive and then the King's stores. And so, yeah, it's kind of interesting how the, the documents are seized and then, but there's no, um, no attempt to take wampum. So show something. Thank you ever so much for these, these presentations. This is a question for Maitre Ledoux. Um, do we need a Delgamuk moment now? It seems to me that that case in the Supreme Court of Canada set oral tradition and written record on a par. Um, and Marshall almost as a backtracking a bit, but is putting wampum on a par with written documents um, as law and not just as fact. Um, do we need a moment like Delgamuk? And is this latest case that I haven't heard about yet uh, of the Supreme Court, you know, a move in that direction where you're actually engaging in what I would call cross-cultural jurisprudence. You're not just approaching these questions from within the tradition of the common law or whatever. You're looking at the common law and the uncommon law, the indigenous law, um, and you're looking at it from both sides instead of just the one. So it was indeed inspiring and is a Delgamuk moment, you know, in the offing where the two are put on a par. Yeah, I hope we can wish for something even better than a Delgamuk moment <laughs> years later. Um, you're right that Delgamuk was, um, was a moment in its own time. Now I think we can we can think a bit broader because even in Delgamuk, um, the oral tradition was still received as 
facts, right? There was, we can feel in the discussion, in the judgment, that there's kind of a discomfort in how to, um, how to hear these um, stories and make them fit in the little square boxes of common law. Um, so I'm hoping that with Montour and Ristol and potentially other cases coming up forward, that we can have um, this broader discussion of, of having wampum belts and other, um, other support for oral tradition being received as law, being received as law. And then there's even if we look even further, we, we can hope to eventually imagine we're definitely not there yet and maybe it's in a couple of generations but to have courts that recognize indigenous judges sitting maybe with canadian judges again there are precedents when we look elsewhere in the world where this kind of those kinds of tribunals happen um canada has uh, we have a lot of work to do C'était, excusez, j'ai perdu. Euh, il y avait une main levée. <rire> Merci. C'est juste pour faire suite euh, à, à votre commentaire, Maître Ledou. C'est, est-ce que vous pourriez nous parler rapidement de des juridictions où on voit justement ce, ce genre de choses, où on voit des juges, euh, deux systèmes parallèles qui euh, qui existent savoir des juges, par exemple, autochtones, est-ce que c'est, on parle de, je ne sais pas, la Nouvelle-Zélande ou... Euh... Oui, je ne pourrais pas parler, en parler autant en profondeur que je voudrais, parce oui. qu'il y a vraiment des gens qui sont spécialisés dans ce genre d'études, mais je pense par exemple au Waitangi Trade Tribunal euh, en Australie. Il y en a d'autres, il me semble, en Nouvelle-Calédonie. Euh, vraiment, euh, je voudrais m'étendre, mais je, je, vais, <rire> je vais laisser à, à d'autres le soin de la là-dessus. Merci. Oh, désolé, hein? Wow. <laughs> um, thank you so much for those uh, super enriching presentations, both of you. I don't have a question. That's why I didn't want to take the mic. But uh, I did want to share something. Um, I'm a visual artist, and uh, I once uh, had uh, the great pleasure of uh, having a conversation with Billy Two Rivers from Ganawage. And um, uh, I'd made a work around uh, the two row wampum, and Billy offered this teaching to me, which I think is maybe interesting for what you're thinking about, which was that uh, the two row, you know, at the base of it is really uh, an understanding between individuals. So it's individual agency. It's our relationships with our mothers, with our fathers, with our husbands, our wives, and our children. And so it's not surprising for me to hear that that's the belt that's brought up to give first agency. This is the way we think, this is the way we are. Not necessarily as a <clears throat> colonial tool of diplomacy, right? That's there too. But um, uh, the, there's, a, there's a moment there where beyond the colonial, right? When we get to like, what do these things really mean uh, that I just wanted to share. Um, I just wanted to ask if you've ever read uh, The Ethical Principles and Cultural Competence, A Duty to Learn, written by um, Chief Justice Richard Wagner uh, of the Supreme Court. Uh, either of you, uh, uh, no, I haven't. and, and have, does it have any kind of impact in decision making in the Supreme Court of Canada? Well. <laughs> I'd be happy to read it, and we're going to the Supreme Court in April for the um, uh, the funding of policing public services on reserve, which will be instrumental. The, the province is currently 
arguing that the principle of the honor of the crown doesn't apply to those agreements because these are administrative agreements. So I'd be really interested to, to read it and make sure that the Supreme Court judges at this April hearing have read it too, but I haven't heard of it. I'll send it to you. I you. saw your email address there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if, thank you. If I can jump on, on the list. Um, J'ai une question pour uh, chacun de vous. Um, pour Jacinthe, uh, j'aimerais peut-être vous entendre développer un, un peu plus sur um, les tensions entre l'approche uh, de, de la souveraineté autochtone que vous avez présentée ou en quelque sorte c'est complètement euh, évacué euh, dans, le, dans le droit canadien. Par, en, en théorie politique, parfois on va parler de la, la proposition absurde de la souveraineté autochtone dans le cadre du droit étatique. Donc on ne peut pas la considérer, on, on ne va même pas prendre en considération l'évaluation de cette revendication-là parce que c'est incohérent avec les fondements même de ce droit-là. Et la transition euh, vers cette approche plus euh, tressé, euh, braiding, de, de systèmes légaux qui semblent vraiment être en tension euh, avec ce, cette approche-là. Euh, Peut-être de dire un peu plus sur comment ça se manifeste, disons, ces tensions-là et la, la transition vers une, une approche différente. Um, pour Riley, um, so I'm very interested with the, the way in which you're, uh, you emphasize the need to consolidate those archives or in the, the ways in which uh, title on land was established or acquired. Um, but when we look at the, the legal regime in, in, in Canada and the making of treaties, uh, New France is generally excluded, right? Compared to Ontario, where before establishing themselves, there's, or not necessarily before, but sometimes after, but there's the process of signing treaties or acquiring title, extinguishing title. Um, was there much of an interest to question if the French had proceeded to properly extinguish, in, in square quotes, the title before, or to ensure that the process was in agreement with their own understanding of how things should have proceeded uh, for the British regime. Sorry, that wasn't entirely clear, but I tried. Wow, that's a huge question, <laughs> but it's a good one. Um, it's a very good question. Le... Ce qu'on remarque, c'est un peu, uh, c'est un peu la question de. It, it depends on how you define self-determination at the end, because if you use the language of sovereignty, then you're right. Like especially external sovereignty, like an independent state, then the Canadian state cannot go there. Otherwise, it extinguishes itself, right? So the Canadian courts are not engaging with these types of arguments because then Canada would no longer. Um, exists as it is. Um, so, but then there's this other interpretation of self-determination that's gaining uh, popularity, maybe that's not the right word, um, gaining traction is the idea of like internal self-determination. And um, in this sense, in this sense, that is, that is slowly happening inside Canada First Nations are gaining more right to self-determination, but then it's a long road. <laughs> Comme récemment, dans la décision avec C-92, on a, la Cour suprême a reconnu la capacité, en fait, c'est la première fois dans l'histoire du Canada que les Premières Nations ont une reconnaissance de leur capacité d'adopter des lois. Or, une reconnaissance d'une capacité, euh, d'une juridiction, finalement, législative. Par contre, la Cour a contourné la question d'enraciner cette compétence législative dans l'article 35 qui aurait, qui l'aurait constitutionnalisé, qui aurait fait en sorte que vraiment cette compétence législative, elle est ancrée dans un droit à l'autodétermination clair, reconnu par l'article 35, protégé. Et elle a plutôt passé par une délégation de l'autorité législative par 91-24, qui est une délégation par le fédéral. Alors, c'est vraiment une lutte, mais c'est une lutte où il y a plus de, 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 il y a plus de mouvements vers l'autodétermination dans une lutte pour la souveraineté interne que dans une lutte pour la souveraineté externe. Mais encore, 
I really liked your thanks for sharing what you shared earlier and you're right like courts and uh, what we just showed it's such a reduction of the complexity and the braiding of legal orders that the Supreme Court um, uh, proposed as an image I feel like the braid that uh, represents indigenous legal orders it doesn't have to be that small right of a braid everything else can exist outside the recognition of the state. Indigenous legal orders don't need to be recognized to be valid. And that's the space for self-determination that doesn't depend on Canadian law. Thanks for the question. Um, so the British absolutely do lean on this idea that the French never um, didn't sign treaties for land, didn't do land surrenders, and that uh, because of their right of conquest, therefore they had like, you know, within the bounds of the province of Quebec as they laid it out, that um, they didn't have to sign land treaties. Um, and so it's a completely opposite situation from what happens in on what becomes Ontario. And it's a kind of an interesting way that like sometimes historians talk about it where um, because, you know, the French didn't do these land treaties that their type of, you know, their colonialism is sort of like this backwards thing, whereas, um, so in compared to like, you know, the British and how it happened before the Royal Proclamation and after, I mean, that assumes that like land treaties are like the proper way to go about colonialism. So that's another can of worms, but, um, and so, but what in the French property system, the seigneurial system allows for an incredible amount of ambigu ambiguity. And so you have these indigenous people moving into territories that, you know, they uh, assume, uh, kind of assumed were their, their own homelands in a way. Um, and then they get, are getting integrated into this paper system of property without really being informed that they are. Um, and it becomes a problem later as the British, you know, taking those, those instruments, legal instruments, but, um, you know, there doesn't have to be an extinguishment of indigenous title in order to have this seigneurial layered property system, right? Um, so I think that's at the base of, of kind of the, the dilemma there. Hi. Um, a number of years ago, uh, we were involved with um, the mining <clears throat> And what happened is that it escalated and that they, they threw uh, a number of people in jail. It was also for the uranium mining in Charbet Lake. So what they did is there was a professor involved in. So how this started to as well as the homeowners came home and their land was staked because they didn't buy the subsurface rights. So, uh, so the appeal to the municipality, but the municipality said, sorry, mining, uh, the mining um, act is under provincial the province so they went to the province and they said sorry it's an environmental uh issue so you have to go to environment canada they went to environment Canada. well sorry so their last resort was that the land was unseated it's like uh, uh, on the ontario side uh because we didn't sign treaty so uh what happened is they had uh, the blockade and whatnot and then ended up throwing people in jail but one of the biggest at the end what happened too as well they st stood fast and that's part of our i'm going to talk about this wampum belt really quickly next is also too as well one of their arguments is yes there's uh three orders of government in canada that needs still needs to evolve you have the civil code you have the uh, common law for the British, the civil code, the French, but uh, what they were asserting is also um, natural law, which is native law. And, and it was because of that, and it's the protection of the land under native law and, and to enhance the Supreme Court rulings, that's, that's why uh, we had a right to protect the land. So the court didn't know how to um, rule on this, so they threw it out of court. So, so again, too, I think we're in an evolution here with these Supreme Court rulings, and, and it's not only uh, de Galmuck right now, too, we're involved again, also, too, with this nuclear waste um, storage dump, really, and again, now, we're under the process of a judicial review, uh, because uh, they, they went ahead, but, and then one of um, the um, arguments, too, as well, I said, 
why have Supreme Court rulings because of the lack of duty to consult and uh, free prior informed consent? Why have Supreme Court rulings in legislation if you're not going to follow them? So, so I think it's just uh, an observation, but I think I, I like your presentation, both of you, and I think this is an evolution and it's an awareness. And I think this, even this gathering was important as well. Miigwech. Miigwech. Do you want to end now or take another question? Is there one last question from the audience? There are a few questions online, but they're quite long, so I don't think we would have time to answer them, but I'm going to show them to you uh, after so you can have a chance of, of seeing the questions. So please uh, join me in thanking our speakers again. Okay, welcome everybody to the final formal session of this extraordinary symposium. We've been hearing little tidbits um, in the form of commentary from our next speaker. So I think uh, you've, uh, Verna McGregor has built up quite a bit of suspense and anticipation. So we're, uh, we're really looking forward to this. So let me introduce our, uh, our speaker formally. Um, Verna McGregor is Algonquin, Omamawinini, Northeastern Algonquin, which includes the Ottawa River watershed. She lives in the Kitiganzibi Anishinaabeg First Nation with her son and grandson. She's worked with elders throughout the years to plan traditional gatherings, including language symposiums. Her relative is the former keeper of the original wampum belts in the community, Elder William Commanda. Her mother would also sit with the former keeper of the belts prior to William Commanda, Elder Teresa Maness. Elder Maness was steadfast in affirming the Jay Treaty belt by attending the annual border crossing celebrations during her lifetime. In the last number of years, Verna and her son, Sheldon McGregor, and brother, Fred McGregor, would meet with Professor Marge Bruchak and, Lee, and Dr. Lise Priot from the University of Pennsylvania in their research on the Lake of Two Mountains belt, which is currently housed at the Vatican Museum. In 2016, Verna and her son, Sheldon McGregor, were requested by the community elders as part of protocol to hold a welcoming ceremony for various sacred items that were being brought from other First Nations into the traditional lands for display at the National Gallery of Canada. The sacred items form part of the Indigenous exhibit for Canada's 150 uh, and a year anniversary um, of Confederation. Um, and the exhibit included wampum, which was part of Verna's wampum beauty. And that was a lovely uh, statement of, uh, of, of relationality. Um, that Verna is situating herself nicely within her network of kin. So please give her a warm welcome. We look very much look forward to hearing from you. There's a lot of uh, shelving space under here. I like it. Kwekakina, uh, bonjour tout le monde. Hello, everybody. As mentioned, my name is Verna McGregor, and I say, Verna, in addition to Kaskishkana, quit Kabanushin, Omama Nini, Kweni. Omama Winini means uh, the Algonquin of the eastern part of Turtle Island. And for us, we were known and still known for the birch bark canoe. And so um, I start with my picture here too as well. This was um, in one of the museums as well. I forget which is um, the photographer, but uh, this is Madeline Clema when we call her Sopanakwe and that was her son. She would visit with my mother a lot too as well when I was young and she would, um, tell her different things and uh, mention different things. So before I start, I, I always, uh, I included also too, this was our traditional dress because um, we were known for, to be hunter gatherers uh, because of the topography here also by the watershed. Uh, so, uh, but also as a little girl, I'll start with my storytelling too. 
Uh, as a little girl, I'd listen to my mom and her talk. And one day she said something about, she goes, uh, one time, there'll come a time, she goes, when, uh, uh, there'll come a time where it'll be free for the women to marry the other women and men to marry other men. And I, as a kid, I was looking at it, go, oh yeah. So I said, I gotta go look at the Sears catalog here and say, oh, two wedding dresses and two suits. And, and But the other part is she goes, when that time comes too as well, the people are gonna come to maybe a realization that they're gonna have to give up their iron horses because there's too many in terms of what, uh, what how this is evolving. And he said, iron horses. But today you look at um, the um, CO2 emissions and the car issue. And I, I said, I find that interesting that you would say that because she was one of the last people to, from the community, she still lived in the bush and she was pretty nomadic, even with all the um, municipalities around. But she would also talk about the traditional, different traditional understandings. So um, very honored to be here. Um, yeah, in addition to really about my background too, I, I did go to school. Um, I studied economics I, I, in Ottawa and then um, went to work for Indian Affairs. I didn't stay there long. Uh, it was really bad back then, the, uh, the uh, racism. So um, I ran into this lady who said, well, why don't you come sell real estate with us? <laughs> and I said, Jill. I come from reserve here. I said, I don't know anything about real estate. You go put your name in the band office and you pray real hard. And, uh, or you pray, you, you find the right family person, no relative. And she goes, that's what school's for. So anyway, I ended up selling real estate in Ottawa, which was totally different to, again, and I get razzed by other people because of this land ownership. But I wanted to understand why there was such this fascination. Then I ran into um, a banking recruiter and they hired me on. And I went to work there, but then realized how much we were left out of this whole um, finance game, really. And then I went to work for the Assembly of First Nations in economic development issues. Then we led to this task force on financing. So then I went, but then I went back to my community and I was the active officer. So, and on and on and on. And, but now I became um, a speaker here at the McCord Museum. That was, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, I always, but what happened to as well is because, uh, I'm still also, um, my mother started the Algonquin language program in the 60s. And um, so also too as well, it was like, it, they talk about this two-eyed seeing. I said, it was like walking two worlds. And in Ottawa, the elders had asked me, can you also do openings and teachings uh, when we get requests? Because sometimes there's misrepresentation. So this is what I do when I do openings. So I'm gonna do an opening for you. And I start with the basics. And I say, welcome to Turtle Island, Mikanak um, And uh, why we say that too as well is also because again, North America is, is shaped like a turtle. And that goes back with also this governance understanding. And it's funny too as well, I was with the Mexican embassy um, about a month ago, and I said, you know, I said, Mexico, you're part of Turtle Island. And they go, really? I said, yeah, you're the turtle's tail. And then now all of a sudden, they're saying, well, we're part of Turtle Island. So, so but I said, how did our ancestors know America looked like a turtle? And that's also to this understanding and this, and this uh, knowledge that goes quite, quite deep. And it's also sometimes, um, that governance is based on that even yesterday when you had Kevin too with the turtle and the turtle's back teaching. Um, and I always talk about this too as well because I did do some work too as well with communities. I, one time I did uh, community consultation with four bands in Alberta on this issue of lateral violence. 
and violence in the communities. Because sometimes too as well, um, we're kind of mean to each other and it's that internalized oppression which leads to lateral violence. So I start from the beginning and I, I always say that too as well, that um, the research scholars uh, estimated on pre-contact of the Americas that the population would be about 112 million in 1492, that's where uh, this colonization started. Uh, while others estimate the population may have been lower, they don't know, but by 1650, there was less than 6 million. <clears throat> but I see this too, what happened here too, I was thinking about that and I said, because there's all this talk about also um, this genocide or the Holocaust. And I said, I think that was a pretty big Holocaust too. But so much so that one of, uh, it is thought that there's an article or research that um, the decline in the population on Turtle Island because of contact also led to this mini ice age. It was a contributor to this mini ice age. And I said, now here we are with colonization and now we're at 8.2 billion in this world. And uh, guess what? We're heating up. So there's that correlation. So anyway, uh, that's one of my um, welcome to Turtle Island. Uh, for me also too as well, uh, we're known as uh, so Mama Ninawak at the, at the Ottawa River watershed. And um, uh, one of our teachings too as well is that uh, women are keepers of the water, men are keepers of the fire. And, and if you look at this map too as well, it, it looks like the veins in your body. And I always said that too as well. If you look at that too from um, a native perspective to there's, because of contact, there was 52 dams now on the Ottawa River watershed. And it's almost like uh, damming up your own veins. Uh, so for us to, as Algonquin, uh, we met a lot of the newcomers and the most uh, famous was Samuel de Champlain. And we met him in 1604 at Tadoussac, which is near Quebec City. And uh, his um, crew were starving and they were sick. So we brought them food and medicine. And soon uh, we became also, we were very helpful and allies, but soon we became nuisance. And when, when they arrived here too as well, they saw the abundance of the resources. And it started with the cod fishery. Apparently you just needed a bucket and you just put it in the water and you, you pull up the fish. John Cabot, I was told by the um, chief of member two, he said that, he said, John Cabot has a red collection where he thought his fish, the, the ship got lodged on a sandbar, but it was really the fish. And so that's how abundant the cod was. And look at the cod fishery today. I do a lot of talks with uh, fisheries and oceans too. The other part came the timber resource and the, the um, northeast part of Turtle Island saw the biggest um, extraction of um, timber for the building of ships and, and the export to Europe. Then next came the fur trade, well, they, were co they coincided. And so with that to the evolution was also the need for hydroelectricity. So there's the damming of the river. And again too as well, um, here we are today, we brought Samuel de Champlain up the Ottawa River because he was looking for a route to China. I said, <laughs> so I said, we help them find China, no, uh, but uh, no, the Eastern uh, to, to trade. But again, to why I'm, I'm leading up to this too as well is because uh, it was this, um, I, I speak a lot about the contrast of the native and non-native understandings and, and it was foretold of where we're gonna be. And, and I think here we are today. Uh, really quick history, I said, again, I go like the creation of the Indian Act, 1876 and reserves. Kitagon Zibi was made, um, made into a reserve in 1853. Again, as I mentioned yesterday, we came also to as well as Antoine Paganawatik was the first Indian Act chief and the leaving out of uh, Lake of Two Mountains. They left during the night 
And when they arrived by Kiragon Zibi to this is a recollection from uh, Theresa Manace. I'm wearing her moccasins to honor her too as well because um, she was the one also, she was the keeper of the wampum belts prior to uh, William Kamanda and she would also come and meet with my mother. So, and I wondered about that though too as well with the, the connection with this Vatican wampum and the also the um, 1853, around the same time, the, um, the uh, lobby for the creation of the reserve in Kitagon Zibi. When they arrived in, uh, by K where Kitagon Zibi is today, uh, it was Teresa Menace's, the uh, great grandmother, uh, Mikaninikwe, realized that she had forgotten the uh, wampum belts when they left Lake of Two Mountains. So she got in her canoe and paddled back to to Oka, and which is not like it's like we uh, it wasn't a train and it wasn't a car. You paddle, and so I guess she thought it was nothing. And to go and and fetch the um, the wampum belts and bring them back uh, for us too as well. Like other First Nations, we had the pandemics. Uh, the late 1800s, the Spanish flu, then TB, and that's connected also to the residential school, but also to even just uh, about three years ago, a bit, bit longer than that, uh, there was a memo found even in our community. And when my mother was alive in, in 2000, this researcher in the archives um, came to see her and she said, he said, I found this memo and it was from the Indian agent. Uh, writing to um, the minister saying that um, I've delivered the um, the blankets and he goes and I wait for your direction but then the next one in about five six years ago the other memo came out and it was from the Indian agent saying I went up to Baskatong um, and um, there's Indians lying in, in the in the snow and there's an, others that are very sick, but he goes, they don't seem to be dying fast enough on reserve. So he goes, I wait your instructions. So that again, too, when you talk about this historical trauma, I think that adds to it too, as well. We also, people don't know too as well, is that we had the pass system. At, time you, at one time you needed a permit to leave the reserve and return. Uh, Post-secondary education, you needed to end franchise to attend university. It was removed out of the Indian Act in the late 1950s and other restrictions such as retaining legal counsel. So again, too, as well, even when I'm listening today, I, I'm thankful, too, for all the scholars here, too, in the participation, because it's part of that mainstream system, but also now it's also uh, blending also, too, as well, bringing back the oral history, but also the Native understanding as to why we're here. The residential school system, which was also the taking of the children, we have all these recollections. When I was working at the AFN, I remember that that was in the early 90s. I'd say that too as well. Uh, why did we have so many social issues? And with the Royal Commission going on, they'd have these testimonials. And um, they would, and the, um, all these stories started coming out about what happened in residential school. And sometimes I couldn't read them because it, it, they were just brutal. So again, to, um, yeah, and that led to also language loss. Then it led to the TRC report recently in 2016. But we still have the Indian Day School. We have the 60s scoop, the murdered and missing women, the sterilization of native women, um, human rights tribunal Chilo. So there's all these issues too. And sometimes too as well, even talking about or sharing issues um, it sometimes becomes a challenge. And I get many meetings where they ask too, can you stay? Because sometimes people get uh, triggered by so just recalling our history. But also too, but going back to now where we we're at, as part of the policy of assimilation, the federal government banned ceremonies and gatherings from 1884 to 1951, an amendment to the Indian Act. The government and its supporters saw ceremony as anti-Christian, reckless, and wasteful of, of uh, personal property. While some communities continued to perform the ceremony in secrecy, others upheld the prohibition in fear of government persecution. Now, why I'm talking about this too as well is 
<clears throat> when I was a little girl, this William Commanda, this is my mother. Um, this is at this um, ceremony for the, the um, Indigenous graduates. He would have um, powwows by Bitterby Lake when I was about four. And uh, we'd have um, Indians from all over. Uh, it, from the, they'd come up from the United States on, on the reserve. And uh, I used to like, we used to like them because we'd go camp there and then we'd meet other native kids and we'd run wild in the bush until when the next one year I was, we were heading there and then my, my father just kept on driving because the RCMP had showed up and they stamped out the fire and they threatened to arrest everybody. So my parents just kept on going. But I remember as a little girl looking out the window and seeing seeing the RCMP in the fire. So we had no gathering that year. And that we stopped having um, ceremonies and uh, gatherings there. And that was the late 69, 70. And we didn't have any powwows or gatherings until 1986. And again, too, as well, that's like this um, uh, history of oppression and trauma. So, um, but he was steadfast because he was also the keeper of the wampum belts. And, um, and again, too, uh, he, would, he was given them in the early 70s by Teresa Menace, who passed them down. And there's a whole history of that, too, in our community in terms of um, not only bringing them back from Lake of Two Mountains, but also, though, too, as well, um, there's stories. There's uh, one time, too, they, they sent them up to Barrier Lake, the next community, for safekeeping because they would be sort of um, like a raid. Uh, I was sitting in a circle with uh, the elders a number of years ago, and they were talking about that they heard that the Indian agent was coming. And they were going, they heard, they knew that the belts were stored up by Rapid Lake. So they were going up to Rapid Lake, Barrier Lake, um, to try and retrieve them. So they sent a runner ahead to, to fetch them and bring them back to, to Kittagong Zibi. So, so again, too, as well, uh, that's why um, knowledge on these belts, too, are, it's evolving because they had to be hidden and they had to uh, be preserved. We still have stories where there's other belts that have been placed strategically also too. And so again too as well, that's where uh, this history comes in and uh, the knowledge. Again too, um, what happened to, there's, um, there's this book called uh, The Mighty Tuscarora. They were also the belts that were uh, that we had originally there was seven and they got whittled away today We have the three original belts in the community and they're basically in hiding because there's so many people who have come forward saying that they want to be be um, keepers and they were lent to um, Deskehe who brought them over to um, England to meet with the Queen too as well to affirm uh, the issue of like the J treaty rights and also too as well the governance. So these belts also, there's a variety, there's social belts, there's uh, governance covenants, but also there's ceremonial belts and the sacred belts. So it's that understanding of that and the ceremonial objects, which were also a part of this confiscation. And, um, and I have, going back to my grandmother, having a story where uh, when my father was small, younger too, staying home, and my dad, uh, my grandfather was on the trap line, you know, and uh, the RCMP kicking down the door and um, accusing, saying that they're coming in to look for alcohol. But what they were really looking for was um, a, a lot of the sacred items. So, a lot of times too, as well, that's why also they ended up in museums and also um, private collections. Two, um, but it's also was the banning of the spirituality and gatherings. So again, too, these are the three that uh, we were talking about. Um, what he's holding on 
Um, the, the middle one, okay, I'll start with the seven fire prophecy belt, which is the middle belt. And um, it's the, um, there's a long story to that. And that's why I said this is like oral history. And uh, what they, it foretold the coming of the newcomers to Turtle Island. And so with the coming of the newcomers, it was foretold to that we will come to a, um, a point where we'll be at a crossroads. And you see the seven diamonds, the seven, the significance of seven, but the middle diamond has two diamonds. It represents that crossroads where it foretold that we're going to come, it, there's going to come a day where uh, the, we may have to come together to, because it's to the detriment of the next seven generations, uh, this crossroads of development. That's also this um, like interpretation where also to as well, like the earth will be in trouble. So, um, and I think I look at today and that's why I speak to a lot of the departments and whatnot. I think we're there in terms of this seven fire prophecy and the way we're going. And I was thinking about Kevin yesterday talking about also things like uh, all the talk in the news. It's a bit disturbing. Um, like, yes, we have to address climate change, but there's, it's the continuation of the contamination of the lands, waters, air to the detriment of everybody. Because one of our teachings too as well, and I always say this in Ottawa, is also with, I talk about the confluence of the rivers, but I also talk about the medicine wheel. And one of the teachings of that is, um, there was the four colors of people on this earth. And uh, I always say that too, we were all given the original instructions because that's one of our stories. And um, we're given the original instructions of four colors of people because regardless of our backgrounds, regardless of our understandings, our beliefs, our language, our history, what binds us together, whether we like it or not, is that um, we all share this earth and we share the four elements. And so again, too, as well, it represents the north, the south, the east, the west, the sun comes up in the east, goes down in the west, cold in the north, warm in the south. Although I always say that climate change is changing it. So, and, but that's what they say too, because the center represents balance. And um, I look at sometimes too, as well, we do have uh, various burial grounds and you see the, uh, the circles on uh, like their markers really. So, um, so here we go. This second belt on top is the sharing belt of 1701. Again, too, as well, um, <laughs> there was the Le Grand Pays, the Great Peace here in Montreal, where they had the 39 nations coming together. And uh, what they talked about here was that there was to be a sharing of the resources with, uh, in three equal parts or the sharing of understanding and caretaking. So there was the three figures holding hands and I say it represents the male or the female name. Uh, the pe humans holding hands, it represents the British, Nishinaabe or uh, native people and the French in, in sharing. And you have the, the cross because they, what I was told, it was also too as well, the sanctioning by the Vatican. And, and but at the same time, uh, I had asked William before, I said, does that also mean to as well that only when, because of the, the role of the church and state with the church, only when we put the, the church aside, will we actually also cooperate as brothers and sisters? And he goes, yes, that could be one of the meanings too. He said, it, it's that it's the, um, the reading of them. The sec, the bottom is the J treaty belt. And again, too, as well, one of the biggest premise behind that is prior to contact, we had no borders and we would freely move around on Turtle Island. And you see that today, too, as well, where you see the different um, uh, artifacts found or archaeological digs. So, um, and that's where the Theresa Menace comes in. And she would go with the uh, Six Nations 
in the Tuscarora by Niagara Falls, and they'd have their annual border crossing um, celebrations. And she did that for over 60 years, really steadfast, say, not having money, but she went anyway, you find a way. So, so again, too, as well, that's where all this uh, resurgence comes. And then I have a picture here where they went to the United Nations, too, as well, with other nations, other, um, and he, William was presenting the Seven Fire Prophecy, and I think if you Google, you could find his speech on there, and that's my two uncles on the side. And uh, I, I like it, too, as well, because back then, too, they went to the United Nations, and they wouldn't let them in. But then he went outside and he said, you know, if it's meant for us to, to go in, we, they lit a smudge and they said, we'll wait. And eventually they were invited in. So I guess it's like, um, but they were talking about the cry of the earth and they were trying to warn that uh, what we're doing to the earth. So, and again to now, I tried to um, <clears throat> put these wampum belts in a, in a modern context. No, I didn't. Um, about 10, 15 years ago, a group from Kittagong Zibi went down to the Smithsonian and there was a similar belt. And I saw you one, there's one upstairs here too. And uh, when they went to the Smithsonian with the elders, uh, the researcher at the Smithsonian had a whole write up, a whole two pages of research on the belt. Uh, at the bottom picture, and she wrote up on the, on the hatchet, you know, she, she researched uh, the war and the war, because we did war with the Haudenosaunee and the Algonquin, and that's another story with the, also the, the fur trade, the beaver wars. But she was talking about um, that, that the hatchet and the significance. When the elders got there, they said, well, no two is well, you turn it around and it becomes a peace pipe. So in, and I always think about this because my mother did study the language, but I like to study the syntax of the words. And what I said is the word for uh, peace in Algonquin is Wanakiwan. And it stems from like, Kiwanadis, Wanadis is rich, and Aki is like the land, Wanakiwan. And uh, Wanadiswin is rich, Wanaki. Wanakiwin, and it, that represents peace. It's through the richness of the land, too, that you derive peace. And that's how expressive the languages are and other languages. And that's where that study is so important. But again, too, with the colonization, there was such a push to erase these languages, but yet um, they offer a different um, complexity. So, uh, and why I included that too as well is a real quick story too, and I said this earlier, is um, two years ago, well, no, it was before Christmas, I did a similar presentation to the uh, Peace, this global center for pluralism had a peace, peace recipients. And I explained, they wanted me to really explain the wampum belts and the biggest teaching I got from Miss Marge here is uh, the the uh, the exp explanation of the quahog and the whelk, because in the wild, the the whelk hunts the quahog, and so and they made beads out of the uh, the whelk and the quahog. So the darker the beads, the the older the quahog. So, um, and then what Lise did is also she studied how the, um, the uh, weaving of these beads together. So again, too, as well, why I'm saying that is also to, you have conflict, conflicting methodologies or ideologies, and how do you weave them together so that uh, you don't, you don't, um, destroy each other that you that's that's that balance so so again too i said so going back to this global center they brought in this country and this country's uh had a peace agreement but when they brought in this group uh the peace agreement 
was um, in jeopardy of falling apart and that they would go back to civil war. And that's why they asked me if they come in and I asked them if they had something similar in their country with their indigenous people that that would be similar to something like these wampum belts where I said, because their peace agreement was 300 pages. And I even asked them, I said, how many of you have read 300, 300 pages and know it by heart? I said, it's also too as well, if you had something symbolic, like a monomic symbol that would represent and that peace agreement that, that would remind the people that why you need to uh, come together. Because going back to this too as well, the peace pipe is when we have gatherings too. There would be a, a peace pipe ceremony to start. Why? Because if you're a pipe carrier, you have the stem and the bowl. If you're a pipe carrier, in our understanding anyway, is that you keep the stem and the bowl separate because the stem represents the male and the bowl represents the female. And they're both separate entities. One doesn't uh, own the other. And uh, so when you're coming together with important issues to talk about, you connect the stem with the bowl and why the, the, piece, the pipe carrier takes so long in the story to load the tobaccos because you're asking all the ancestors to come in all the birds all the fish it's not just humans the ones that crawl the the, um, the trees the stones the star beings the stars the universe because when you light that also it's you're asking all creation to come in and it's a reminder to the people meeting that what they're meeting on sometimes you have to consider all the interconnection of everything. And if you don't have this conversation or to take the time, what does it lead to sometimes? It goes upside down that you may have conflict in war. So, so I, I said that's a, a version of this wampum belts and that's why they'd have gatherings for days sometime. And so, uh, yeah, it's not the agenda. And uh, I have the pictures where I went with the, uh, also, wampum was also used as currency, as you heard earlier. I won't go into that, but that was with the Bank of Canada. Uh, brings back memories, right, Marge? <laughs> uh, and I do talk a lot these days, too, as well, because of the seven fire, uh, that we are in uh, a different time. And uh, I talk a lot to the um, ECC and our counties, but for us, as Algonquin, we were known, we weren't known for the teepee, we were known for the Picogon, which is the oval wigwam. And because, why? Because there was such an abundance of uh, trees and bark and birch. So, and, because um, you would, it would be region specific, the housing. So, our um, housing was temporary. Compared to today, we have uh, the, um, the um, subdivisions. The only problem with that is how much of the ecosystem do we destroy and the permanency of that. And so the other part is I do a lot of uh, um, climate change conferences. And I said, there, we traveled by canoe. And I always say, I said, you know, we travel carbon free. And I said, I don't mean to brag, but, and uh, I said, but they talk about that. We have to, we may go back and we have to find some, that kind of mindset now. And here we are because you look at also too as well, uh, the carbon uh, from our transportation and uh, no wonder our world is heating up. So uh, yeah, and one of the teachings of the canoe too, of course it teaches you balance, but it's also represents too as well. Um, if you're a parent too, one of your biggest responsibilities is that you give your, your children the next generation enough skills to paddle their own boat, paddle their own way. So, uh, yeah, and the other one in the house is we don't own anything. We were nomadic, and we were nomadic too as well because that understanding if you stay in one place, you over-harvest the resources. And, and the other, from a spiritual point, we don't own anything. And my last one is, um, this was the structure that was done for uh, Canada's 150 with the, uh, this Manuel Baez. 
and um, he put the circle in the middle, and uh, I said, that looks like a soccer ball, Manuel, on the floor. He goes, well, it's supposed to represent uh, the earth and Turtle Island. I said, well, it still looks like a soccer ball. And um, what he did was he uh, cut a cross section. The, the floor is a cross section of a tree because the trees do record time. And he put the four benches, meaning like the four, the four colors of people, the four directions, the four seasons. And uh, out behind these benches is our growth outwards as Canada, which Canada is a young country. But on top, he put the, the, um, the dream catcher. But press the dream catcher also represents the spider teachings, the web of life. The spider weaves the web of life, because that's including the universe. Because also, too, as well, one of the biggest teachings is that what we do to the earth, we eventually do to ourselves. So on that note, um, I'm coming to an end. I didn't think I could talk so long. Um, the other part is also now, I was reading too as well, uh, when Lise first brought the rough draft of the uh, Vatican um, wampum, uh, I was reading the Algonquin um, translation and then the English translation. And I said, sometimes I said, it, and, I, and I was wondering about the Haudenosaunee part, too, as well. I said, I wonder how they translate it, too, if you know the language. But again, to um, and it's that opening, that, that discussion, and I think it's a good thing. The other uh, part is also, though, uh, I also brought, I feel like I'm your fan club here, <laughs> Marge. Uh, she, I, I brought her book in because um, I was reading it. Uh, there's there's things that I took from it, but my bro she quoted my brother on uh, the wampum belts uh, because sometimes too as well um, I think about this repatriation because it is complicated. I said too as well, like it, it is like we're uh, as we heal each ourselves too. And, and it's bringing back those understandings at, to get to as well the third level of government, like the three people or the, three, the, the third level of the justice system. How do we do that? But I had my, um, I'm just trying to find my page. My brother uh, was quoted in this because we, they just come, and he also does a lot of uh, public uh, events but also, um, we, we still also had some of the Haudenosaunee teachings too, because uh, my great great grandmother was also uh, a Mitchell. And I have a story about that, but that's it. And um, but so she would also teach my mother different things. And that's why I said too as well, uh, that's why I think we had these uh, wampum belts between also the Haudenosaunee and the Algonquin too as well, because they were also peace, and there is all that recollection, and that's oral recollection. But I'll read what he was, what, this is what Marge wrote. No, uh, like the Haudenosaunee rituals of condolence that were designed to guide grieving or conflicted parties out of conflict and towards clear-mindedness, collaborative models of repatriation research would improve museum relations with indigenous claimants. As Fred McGregor, Kabul Nishin, Humama Ninue, and Algonquin from Kitagon Zibi community has suggested, some of the objects that went missing are rather like indigenous children who survived the residential schools. They have been mistreated and mishandled and abused and are trying to find themselves again. They come back to us as these broken people. But when they are made whole again, when they're given a place to be, we can heal each other. No matter what they have been through, they are still part of our shared history. Even if they appear to be strangers, they are still our kin. And, and I think about that a lot, too, as well, as we're talking about this repatriation. And I'm very honored to be here, and, and I thank the organizers for doing this, too, as well, because I think we, we, it opens that conversation, and I think we need to have that, too, as well. 
and also it's that reconnection to to our relatives, which are our sacred items. So I say, miigwech kakina, and um, thank you for listening. And young uh, guamsen means um, as you're doing all your research, don't forget to look after yourselves. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just struck um, at the, we've just heard these, uh, these nice words from Verna McGregor, just as yesterday uh, we heard um, from Kevin. And I'm just, I'm struck by the, uh, the, ethic, the, the power of ethical storytelling. Um, and it's just, you know, it seems to flow naturally from, from these two people who, who, who've, who've, who've got their, their moral compass uh, firmly anchored. Um, and I guess it's an invitation to, to the rest of us, whether we're in universities or courts of law or museums or what have you, to, to think of some of those principles as well. And the, the wampum with its power to condole uh, to think about the truth and exchange. I think those are nice, uh, nice metaphors um, for us to think with. And I, I'm just going to abuse my position here as well. I'm also, I have a, there's another metaphor that was coming to mind listening to you. This idea of wampum being buried um, constantly. We, we, we've heard of that um, on several occasions um, for all sorts of reasons. But this idea of keeping sacred records, important records, having to bury them to protect them um, and to contrast that, that sort of um, image of, um, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a violence and a, and, a, and, a, and a need to protect that's there that's so important. And you think of, the, think of the, the museum building and the archive building with all the power and the resources of the state uh, protecting those archives. So we have access to these uh, these objects and archives under very, very different, uh, different conditions. So I think it's uh, this act of, of unburying the wampum and, and hearing the stories, I think, is, uh, is so important. So we have, Verna has graciously agreed to take some questions. So if anybody has any for her, please, um, okay. you have please put minute. your hands up. One minute. No. <laughs> <laughs> Ojo me gwech gibe kinamage in kid bajmo in. That one with the newspaper, it looked like there was four belts. Like I was look, trying to look at the the men are all standing there, ninwoka naniwewok, and then they're holding that big belt, yeah. and then there's like children there, and then it's draped. Yeah. And you showed pictures of three belts, but actually on that one, I was wondering if there's uh, three belts draped over it, and then the men are holding one. So to me, it looked like there was a total of four, but uh, the picture's too grainy. Yeah. So I, I wondered if there was four. Well, there was four a number okay. of years ago, uh, but also originally there was seven belts. Oh. And then it's this confiscation. And when in William's time, he was at an event and one of the belts went missing too. Oh. Yeah, so that's where uh, uh, there's a need to protect uh, the, original, the original belts too. And our understanding too is other nations too as well, they have their own spirit. And uh, when I remember when he passed, I was saying this, he passed um, the year he passed, the day he passed, I. I was going into town and this person came up to me and he, he followed me and he goes, I'm supposed to be the bell carrier. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, first of all, I said, um, William just passed yesterday. And I said, there's a mourning period and a, a condolence period also for the family. I said, but the other part is too as well, if it, with this, when you're looking at sacred items and spiritual items too as well, if they're meant to come to you, they they will and also though too as well and why i have an interest in them too as well is that i i have i do get dreams about them and i was just telling that even with uh, with uh lee's uh, having a dream that i was in a morgue i thought i was in a morgue i woke up that this is the vatican belt i woke i had this dream that i in my dream i woke up 
and I was in a mor I thought I was in a morgue. It was all gray, all these cabinets. And I said, oh, wow, I'm dead. And, uh, but then I, I stand up and I see this big vault door with the round thing on it. And then it starts to open. And then this girl looks over and she goes, come on. And I come out of the vault and I go into this parking lot and I go up this hill and there's people there trying to do ceremony and they're native people. And I said, oh my God, they're doing it wrong. And uh, but what they were doing sometimes too is they were falling down this hill. And, and, I, and I wake up and I go, oh, where do these dreams come from? And uh, about two days later, honest to God, I get a call from Lise. And she goes, well, um, I'm March Professor Bruchak's student, and I want to come up to Kittagon uh to share the information that I've gathered so far on the, uh, the belt at the Vatican. And this started on an off remark by my brother Fred when they came up like uh, 15 years ago. Eh? Uh, he said, well, if you really, really want to do wampum research, he goes, go find the one at the Vatican. And that's what they did. And here we are today. So I think, too, as well, everybody's on their own journey. But also, though, too, as well, there's other dreams that I had in terms of also how you read them, too. It's not just the symbols. So uh, so that's why I said, too, as well, there's sacred items, too, and they have spirit. And that's the, the respect, too, as well. And, uh, yeah, and it's honoring them. And I honor all your researchers, too, I think. I think you're all wonderful. So, miigwech. Hey, miigwech. Question from online is, is the Ottawa watershed part of the dish with one spoon, Matt? Uh, no, I think that's more, uh, more of the Great Lakes area. But it also, though, the, the uh, message is the same, though, too, as well. Uh, really, uh, my, what I get from this, too, as well, food unites us. And, and for us to come together. And that's also with, through our ceremonies. But also, when we do ceremony, a lot of times is also, too, as well, there's feasting. And, and the importance of, uh, that, of sharing, too, as well. Good. Good. Thank you. Any final question? I'm sorry, but are you hearing an echo from me? No. Oh, good. It's just in my own. An echo. <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> Humor. Yeah. Um, the final uh, comment from online is simply miigwech to Verna. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and oh, for talking to us. So that's maybe a lovely note to end on. Yes. Yes, okay, great. Thank you very much. I will leave the last word of this um, convening to Jonathan, but I would like to express gratitude on behalf of everyone at the McCord Stewart Museum. It was quite vibrant and moving to see how Wampum continued to bring people together and that they continue to resonate in the hearts and minds of people here today. So on behalf of everyone at the museum, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to all of the speakers and moderators who have traveled to come here today to share some of their worldviews, research, knowledge, and questioning. We would like, to, we will make the presentations available online as a record and testament of these fruitful conversations. To all of the participants who as well patiently embrace technological hiccups, thank you for your patience. And I would like to reiterate our sincere appreciation to Power Corporation for providing financial support which allowed us to invite national and international scholars to gather with us here for, for two, the last two days. I would also like you to give a warm round of applause to all of the great museum staff who have um, provided a stellar organization and provided a warm welcome to all of us. So Maria Luisa, Leila, Marion, Fadila, Julien, Arnaud, 
Sabrina, Philippe, David, Harvey, Joanna, thank you very, very much. Merci. Thank you as well to the team of La Boîte Rouge Vif, who has been recording and taking pictures of this event, which we'll be sharing at some point. And uh, last word of um, gratitude to Jonathan, of course, for assembling and sharing this event so thoughtfully, as well as to Catherine Debarra, who provided uh, incredible input and support throughout the preparation of this event. Thank you very much. Before I wish you well, uh, off, to, uh, off to your onwards journey and maybe to a, a drink of wine, uh, I would like to invite Jonathan to close the event. No wine? So no wine, but <laughs> the exhibition is open uh, until six tonight if you'd like to still um, um, tour it. So Jonathan, it's your turn. Thank you. Wow, what a dense and rich and stimulating two days we just went through. History, anthropology, law and court cases, archives, traditional knowledge, linguistics, museology, collections, history, material culture study. That was a multidisciplinary symposium with multiple perspectives from international. That was amazing. The interest was there. I think it's clear. There was up to 275 people online yesterday, I believe, and around 200 today. We were, what, 80, 100 people uh, on site. That's fabulous. I mean, uh, I think everyone enjoyed what they heard, what they saw. Uh, the beauty of a symposium is also the fact that we get to know each other. Uh, we meet people we have read the work of. Uh, we learn new names, new research projects, or we meet again after uh, 10 or 15 years sometimes. So it's uh, the, the retrouvaille in some ways. One of the goal of this exhibition uh, upstairs that you have seen was to make known the wampum belts and objects preserved in Canada and in France. 40 of them were put in one room. Uh, we also brought out of the Vatican the belt that is there for 192 years. It never happened before. It was the first time it came on its original territory. The four wampum uh, with Latin words that Lee's mentioned yesterday were back on their land for the first time at once. So that's another layer of first. So we're really proud of uh, what we achieved. Um, we believe it was a first. And uh, since wampum are in museum, I don't believe that accessible to a public, it happened before. And as a historian, I'm not supposed to predict the future, but I believe that it, it will not only be the, the first, but probably the last. I'm not sure it will happen again for different reasons that we can uh, discuss. But still, um, it means that you, uh, you had this privilege to, uh, to participate, to be part of this, um, of this uh, historical moment. With this exhibition and symposium, we also wanted to create and foster discussions, generate knowledge, create a space to exchange information, data, perspectives, and I think that we can see that we succeeded, thanks to you all, thanks to the speakers and presenters. Now, what do we do from there? Well, I think it belongs to us, um, as it is up to you, to us, individually and collectively to decide. What do you want to do? There are still debates, and that's fine, uh, between researchers, but I think we have shown that we have much more in common, Much we have a lot in common, in, and in our will to better understand these objects and to give them the place they deserve in the current world we live in. Uh, the fact that they are used in the court cases is uh, one evidence of, of the, the need to better uh, understand them, but also situate them and give them back their importance today. Uh, I once heard Darren Bonaparte, uh, who said that we are in the new era of wampum belt. And then I think uh, Rick Hill uh, said about the same thing yesterday. And I think they are right. Um, we probably never spoke so much about wampum for the 200 last years. Um, does it make sense? 200, 200, anyway, you understand from, since the 200, since 200 years, anyway. Um, and I remember a photo of uh, Kevin Deere on Facebook. It was a show of drones showing wampum belts in the sky. I think this is wampum 2.0. 
uh, really, when you think about it, imagine our ancestors seeing this in the in the sky. That would have been crazy. But we are there now. So no, they're really visible. There, there are many reproductions. They're brought in publicly. Alan is doing several uh, conferences with reproductions of wampum belt. So I think it's in the air, and I think indeed we are in the, this new era of um, wampum belt. Uh, all of this, of course, was made possible because of the hard work and goodwill of the wonderful uh, McCord team, uh, McCord Stewart team, as uh, Anne pointed out. But Anne, you forgot to uh, thank someone, and it's you, because uh, if I remember well, this symposium idea came from you, and I think uh, uh, we, we can we can thank you for this because we 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 made it, and it was uh, your idea. And of course, all of this was a huge success thanks to you, presenters, speakers, the people in the audience um, who accepted to, to come, to uh, listen, and the speakers to speak and share their expertise. So I warmly thank you. Uh, Nyawen, Tiawenk, merci, miigwech, and all of that. Thank you.